protection from mammograms or chest X-rays may put some young women at increased risk of developing breast cancer, a new study suggests. That was one of the topics at this health subcommittee hearing. Congressman Frank Pallone of New Jersey is the chairman. The meeting of the subcommittee is called to order, and I'll first recognize myself. Uh, the subcommittee is meeting today to review the new breast cancer screening recommendations issued by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force just a few weeks ago. By now, I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with the new guidelines, or at least we're familiar with the controversies surrounding them. From what I've heard from my constituents, friends, family members, and academic institutions in my district, there are a lot of questions, frustration, and confusion around these new recommendations. The controversy that was ignited by the report may be eclipsing what the report actually says. And this is the reason why I'm holding this hearing today. It's time for all of our questions to be answered. We want a clear understanding of what the report did and didn't say and what others have to say about the report. We also want to understand the process used by the task force. Should they operate, for example, with more transparency? Do they get sufficient input from stakeholder groups? Do they consider different opinions? And I have invited the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force to speak directly about their work. It is my hope that we will all walk out of this room later today with a better understanding of how these recommendations came about, how they should be viewed, and what exactly they mean. We want to get these answers. We want to know as much as we can because women and their doctors deserve to know what is best. I also want to hear from organizations, advocacy groups, and medical experts. We don't want the task force's report to stand alone if there are different opinions. I know that some of the frustration is due to the fact that this recommendation was seemingly made with little input from these groups. That may be a problem of process as well as a problem with the substance of the report, and they will have a platform and a voice today. The United States is at the forefront of medical research and innovation. Investment in science has led to the development of early detection methods for certain cancers. It has led to treatments and cures for diseases once considered a death sentence. And it is important that all of this new medical information is used to empower physicians and their patients when making medical decisions. This information should be used to help patients and their doctors. It should not be used, and I stress, it should not be used as an excuse to deny needed care. Scientific studies enable patients and their physicians to make more informed decisions about what is best for them in any given situation. These studies should be one of many tools. Patients and their doctors should have access to as much information as available. They should have informed conversations. But the decisions about mammography for women in their 40s should remain with women and their doctors. There is a lot of disagreement in the medical community about when exactly to begin using mammography screening for breast cancer. Studies have shown that mammograms save lives, while at the same time others have highlighted the risk associated with the test. For example, an article published in the New York Times just yesterday cites a new study that indicated that the risk associated with yearly mammograms can actually put high-risk women at an even greater risk to develop breast cancer in their lifetime, though at the same time the study authors caution that more research is needed to make a more conclusive recommendation. And it appears to me that the takeaway message from all of this is that more research is needed and there is already quite a bit of disagreement within the community as, what is best, as to what is best for the patient. But remember, our goal is to provide the best ways of preventing, detecting, and treating breast cancer. All the studies, reports, and recommendations should be used with that goal in mind. And I also believe that we do not want this study or any other study to be used as an excuse by insurance companies or others to deny mammograms or treatment that would help women. And again, the decision should be between the women and their doctors, not with the insurance companies. Um, essentially, we want stakeholders today in the task force and all groups to be heard. We want people to understand whatever recommendations are made and what the implications are from these recommendations. So I want to thank uh, the witnesses that are here today and for coming on relatively uh, short notice. And at this time, I would recognize our ranking member for, for the, our temporary ranking member, I guess, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blunt. Well, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Deal will be here at some point during the hearing. I'm glad to uh, substitute for him uh, in this chair for a little while today. I certainly thank you for holding uh, this hearing. 
uh, on the uh, recent recommendations on breast cancer screening. I think there will be large agreement from the committee uh, in, and concern about those recommendations. Uh, these new guidelines or these new uh, proposed guidelines have caused a great deal of confusion for women uh, and their families. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, no longer recommends routine mammograms for women between the ages of 40 and 49. Uh, yet this group accounts for about one out of six instances of breast cancer. I believe it is a huge mistake to send a message to women uh, and their families that, and health care providers that an early alert system is not beneficial or may not be beneficial. As a cancer survivor myself, I am uh, very interested in hearing from members of the task force on why these recommendations were formalized, uh, how they were finalized and then communicated to the public. Uh, because I know how important screening was for me on two different uh, cancers on two different occasions uh, as part of my annual physical. Uh, as we all know, health care reform uh, has been a hot topic for this Congress. Uh, in a time when we have been talking about encouraging more prevention uh, in the health care arena, these recommendations run counter uh, to almost every other discussion that we are having. I am also concerned about how these recommendations could be interpreted should the House passed health care bill become law. I find it unlikely or at least uh, uh, questionable that the government run uh, health benefits advisory committee would, would propose including services in an essential benefits package uh, that another government appointed board has recommended are not necessary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think this is an important hearing. I uh, congratulate you for holding it. Uh, I look forward to working with you and our ranking member, Mr. Deal from Georgia on the subcommittee as we work to figure out how and why these uh, confusing recommendations were made. Thank you, Mr. Blunt. Uh, next is our chairman, Mr. Waxman, the gentleman from California. Thank you, uh, Chairman Pallone, for uh, holding this important hearing. Today we are going to talk about an issue about which people have strong views, which women should be routinely screened for breast cancer and when. It is a question that resonates with every person in this room. We all know someone, a family member or friend, who has received a breast cancer diagnosis. In some instances, this may be a younger woman in the prime of her life. Indeed, just a few weeks ago, this subcommittee heard powerful testimony from a member of our own congressional family, Representative Wasserman Schultz, about her diagnosis and treatment for breast cancer at age 40. The new guidelines for breast cancer screening that were recently issued by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force have placed this issue front and center again. I emphasize the word again because this is not the first time recommendations about the use of mammography and breast self-exams have been revisited by the task force or NIH or any number of cancer-related research or advocacy groups. Just as we have seen with prostate cancer screening, immunization schedules, and even last week's cervical cancer screening, as well as numerous other services, new information or new interpretations of old information often result in a change in what the experts tell us works at, at all or works most effectively uh, at all. Uh, and this is how it is supposed to be. As the science of medicine evolves, so too should the recommendations on the best use of that science. I believe that is what the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force set out to do in making a review of its 2002 mammography guidelines, to take a fresh look at what has been learned over the past last several years and, based upon that body of work, to provide its best professional judgment on what doctors and their patients should consider when they are making decisions about breast cancer screening. While that judgment may be contentious, I have no doubt it was driven by science and by the interpretation of science and not by cost or insurance coverage or the ongoing health care reform debate. I am also confident that these recommendations are just that, recommendations, and that the task force would not expect them to be used to take the place of a considered opinion of a physician and a patient. 
As we will hear shortly, there is a deep divide about these guidelines among other experts that I believe work, uh, that I believe together with the task force share the primary goal of ensuring the best possible care for women. We want to learn more about those differing views today and understand better exactly what the task force has proposed and why. But in the end, what must prevail is a set of recommendations that is evidence-based, backed by science, and supported by experts in the field. American women and their doctors deserve and are entitled to nothing less to inform their decisions, not to make them, but simply to inform them. I hope that will be our sole focus here today. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses and thank them in, in advance for their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Waxman. Next is the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I hate to disappoint Mr. Waxman, but this will not be our sole focus today because this is the canary in the coal mine. This is what we get when we have government intervention starting to dictate health care policy decisions. And, and this will not be taken outside the context of H.R. 3962, which will then set up a government system and will eventually ration care. And when you have government commissions setting policy instead of a doctor and a patient relationship, you get this. So, so don't be surprised if, if we do not focus on how this is just one small example of how health care will be delivered in this country pretty soon, 2013, and definitely in 10 or 15 years. Uh, we'll be able to point out in H.R. 3962 uh, the ratings of A and B in the essential benefits package, and the highest uh, rating of C, women would not receive access to regular mammograms until the age of 50. One estimate finds a rational care like this would result in 50,000 preventable deaths from women under the, who go undiagnosed. H.R. 3962 does give the Secretary the ability to add benefits, but only after getting approval to do so from a new bureaucracy that is created called the Health Benefits Advisory Council. Will the new Health Benefits Advisory Committee take into account costs when making decisions? Will the committee make recommendations another government board like the task force has said shouldn't be covered? When mammograms and other services aren't covered by a government, where will people turn? In, in Canada, we know those people can turn to the U.S. market. In the U.K., they are allowed to do well, uh, they are allowed to purchase their own private plan, thus creating a two-tiered system. Under H.R. 3962, we create the same tiered system for the rich, one for the rich, and one for the poor. The Secretary can approve additional benefits to be covered or enhanced and a premium plans to be offered in the exchange. These plans will cost more money and in 2013, 2014, anyone receiving subsidies to help them afford insurance can only purchase a basic plan. How will these people receive coverage? So here is proof. The government will have the ability to come between you and your doctor and that we won't need a single payer to get there. The government run public option will allow them the same ability to ration care. And I yield back my time. Gentlewoman from California, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very important uh, hearing today. Um, I want to welcome the witnesses, uh, the members of the task force, uh, the National uh, Breast Cancer Coalition, the American Cancer Society, and the Susan Komen uh, uh, Foundation uh, here today as well, and uh, to thank you all uh, for your work. Um, I'll put a, a, a place a full statement in the record, but uh, there are a couple of points that I'd uh, like to make um, uh, at this uh, moment, and that is, uh, number one, uh, I think that uh, if we wander away from science, from evidence-based science in our country, uh, then it will be a march to folly. Uh, sometimes we uh, debate, and we should, and question uh, the scientists and how they arrived at the conclusion that they have come to. But science is something 
that uh, has been honored by the American people uh, for a very, very long time. We have come through a period of time where science was not honored by the Congress. It was political science that drove it. And scientists within the government uh, were muzzled, and we paid a big price for it. Uh, certainly, the task force and uh, uh, coming out with their information, um, uh, I, I wish there were maybe a better communications plan. I think a lot of people were simply not prepared all of a sudden to be hearing what the task force came out with. Uh, but now is the sober and the prudent time to examine what the task force has come out with and why and where that, that may take us. Now, on the issue of national health insurance, of course our Republican friends are going to try and drag this into that. Uh, but I remember too many times where they were too slow to take up the call to reform, uh, reform, reform, to bring services to women, especially poor women, uh, in the fight against breast cancer. So uh, today is a most important hearing uh, and we need to remain, I think, devoted and dedicated to solid science in our country and to pay heed to that. Uh, and uh, if, I think that that really drives to the core uh, of what we're here today for. And uh, God help us if we don't. Uh, this is not about anybody's political science, as much as members are tempted to drag that into it. And I might say that insurance companies, private insurance companies, have long made decisions about who they want to insure and what they will cover. And uh, women and uh, their complicated bodies have been left out of so many of those decisions and not covered by them. Uh, and that's why we've engaged in a whole new debate and uh, hopefully we'll be successful with our efforts to reform all of that. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you for having the scientists the experts that are here today for us to query, to understand better, and uh, uh, their recommendations, uh, and that uh, with that we will be far more confident uh, uh, about uh, the discussion and the debate that they've brought forward. So thank you. And I thank the gentlewoman. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with the, uh, the gentlelady's previous statement that the fight against cancer knows no ideological or partisan lines, and I'm certain the doctors who will be testifying before us today would agree with that. And it is a disease. Cancer is a disease that all Americans fear, and one that is all too often very, very close to home. We've learned in this committee that cancer is a complex disease, still has no cure, but efforts geared toward prevention, early detection, and treatment have made significant gains. We start there. Because as we embark upon this hearing, we must remember not to embrace policies that would undo the successes that we've enjoyed. And I agree we should not make this partisan, but the 2,000-page gorilla in the room is the bill that this House passed two weeks ago. And if things were just to stay as they are now, then the task force recommendations would be just that, recommendations, doctors be free to, to accept them or, or reject them. But what we have written into legislative language may take some of that freedom away from doctors and may take some of that freedom away from patients as well. Cancer strikes roughly one third of all women in the United States and 13,000 Texans are expected to be diagnosed with breast cancer this year. So we come to these new recommendations made by the United States Preventative Services Task Force and they made some pretty dramatic statements regarding breast cancer screening. Now, the whole concept of not participating in a monthly okay, maybe that's a good thing, but I cannot tell you, as a physician practicing obstetrics and gynecology for 25 years in North Texas, the number of new cancers that were brought to my attention by the patient herself who found something on exam. In fact, the young ob -GYN physician learns very early in their course not to question the patient's clinical judgment when they come in and tell you something is wrong because very likely something is wrong. We're all happy when the tests show that, in fact, there was no problem, but more often than not, there is going to be something there that does deserve further scrutiny. Now, we had these task force recommendations come up two weeks ago, and I went home to Texas 
And on my desk, waiting for me, was uh, a periodical called OBGYN News. Not necessarily a peer-reviewed scientific journal, but articles of the day which are of interest to practicing OBGYNs are discussed. And they had a story that, I, ironically, was the day before the task force recommendation came out that said, headline, breast cancer deaths higher without routine screening. And this was uh, from a report given to the American Cancer Society out in San Francisco, and a rather startling statistic that uh, a Dr. Katie reported to this group, the 345 breast cancer deaths, which was nearly three-fourths of the total, were in women who were not regularly screened. Women who were regularly screened had 25% of the cancer deaths. Women who did not have regular screening, 75% of the cancer deaths. I think that's trying to tell us something. And I think, again, the 2,000-page gorilla in the room is this new, brave new world of healthcare, which Congress is going to dictate how things are happening. And the recommendations of the United States Preventive Task Force now carry the weight of law, if you will, under the auspices of the Secretary of Health and Human Services or whoever the healthcare commissar is that, that they designate. So I thank you for having this hearing. I think it's extremely important. I think it's extremely timely. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. Dr. Brawley, always good to see you. And uh, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. The um, gentlewoman, is she not here? Oh, yeah. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Capps. Thank you, Chairman Pallone, for holding this hearing. I'm so pleased that you and we all have responded quickly to the release of the task force's recommendation because there has been a lot of confusion underscoring the value of having hearings like this uh, in our House of Representatives. I have just returned, as we all have, from our Thanksgiving break and I was with my family. And in fact, um, as an aside, I uh, received my own annual mammogram uh, during that time. I can assure you that the message is out there but I'm afraid it's not necessarily the accurate one. So I'm looking forward to hearing in greater detail today how the task force arrived at its conclusions and what the recommendations really mean in private and practical sense. Unfortunately, there are people who have completely twisted what the task force is, what the task force does, and what its recommendations mean. The scare tactics I've witnessed since the release of the recommendations have been deplorable, quite frankly. The recommendations are based on scientific findings. This is so important to underscore. Now, we know there is not always consensus within the scientific community or within the advocacy community, both groups so important to us in setting public policy. But we in Congress owe it to our constituents and the public to listen to what a reputable group of experts in evidence-based medicine and prevention have to say. Furthermore, we owe it to them to refrain from engaging in partisan rhetoric about what these recommendations mean. The United States Preventive Services Task Force issues guidelines for a whole range of preventive services. They do not make coverage determinations for insurance companies, public or private. And ultimately, all decisions should be made between patients and their health care professionals. The task force's website affirms that their purpose is to present health care providers with information about the evidence behind each recommendation, allowing clinicians to make informed decisions about implementation. At the end of the day, this information that clinicians should use to make decisions in consultation with their patients and nothing more. So I, I look forward to hearing in greater detail what the task force concluded and how they arrived at these conclusions, and I hope we can stop with the false accusations. Before I yield back, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter a letter from the Partnership for Prevention into the record. Uh, the Partnership is a group of reputable uh, organizations, the Academy, American Academy of Family Physicians, Nurse Practitioners, Physicians Assistants, and on and on. There's about 10 of them. And they are calling attention to our committee uh, on the three most common misstatements that have appeared in the media, uh, one being that women, uh, that the task force recommends that women age 40 to 49 not receive mammograms. This is nowhere in the report that uh, the intention of the task force was to reduce cost. This is nowhere in their analysis and that they are not qualified. These are the, some of the misstatements out in the public that these, this task force is not qualified to make recommendations or that they have other agendas in play. And I ask that the uh, letter be made part of the record. And I yield back. 
Without objection, so ordered. Next, thank you, Ms. Capps. Um, next is the gentleman from uh, Georgia, Mr. Gingrey. Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you. And uh, we, we've heard already some comments from the Democratic side regarding uh, the danger of ignoring science if we go down that road. Uh, I don't think we're talking about uh, Newton's third law here, by the way. Uh, we're not talking about exact science. We're talking, uh, I think, about an opinion uh, that a judgment that's made by the United States Preventative Services Task Force, uh, 15 or so members, uh, based on, on uh, looking at a lot of studies. Uh, I will tell you, uh, as a uh, practicing OBGYN physician, uh, like my colleague uh, from Texas, Dr. Burgess. Uh, I've spent 26 years uh, practicing medicine uh, in that specialty. I am a very proud member of the American College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology and a board certified fellow. Uh, and we take our recommendations uh, uh, from that organization uh, and from the, the standard of care in the community, uh, my community, the greater uh, Atlanta area, of what is best practices. Uh, and the American public, and particularly uh, the American women, uh, they know who the American Cancer Society is. They, they know uh, who the Susan G. Uh, Corman for the Cure organization is. Uh, so many of them uh, help raise money for that organization. But very few of them have ever heard of the United States Preventative Services Task Force or in what uh, department they're embedded and how much power they have and how much authority they may have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, they'll find out pretty darn soon. Uh, and I would, I would refer them to pages in both the House and the Senate bill uh, that uh, the, the Senate bill, of course, pending the House Bill 3962 uh, and let them just connect the dots and to see the, the, uh, the power uh, that, that this organization, this U.S. Preventative Ta Services Task Force, no matter what they call it, uh, to tell physicians basically uh, that this is not an A or B recommendation, this is a C recommendation. Well, Mr. Chairman, if the President had followed through, if the Congress had followed through on the President's recommendation of, of having meaningful medical liability reform uh, in these pending uh, health care bills, then maybe physicians like myself would not have to worry too much if we decide to follow the United States Preventative Services uh, Task Force guideline uh, and not order a mammogram for our patients between the ages of 40 and 49 or not recommended to them that they do breast self-examination and we missed a breast diagnosis of cancer and they died from that disease. Uh, or, on the other hand, uh, if we decided to ignore the recommendation and we did the mammogram and, and, a, and a lump was detected or a suspicious marking on the mammogram, the patient had a needle biopsy. It turned out to be benign, but unfortunately she developed a breast abscess uh, and then the physician gets sued for not following the recommendations and doing something that is, quote, unnecessary. So you put doctors in an untenable position and you put their patients at risk of death. So I think we, uh, I can't wait to hear from Susan G. Corman uh, and from the American Cancer Society and obviously from the uh, Preventative Services Task Force and the others on the panel. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, uh, I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Th thank you, Chairman Pallone. And given the confusion, the fear, and the uncertainty, the updated recommendations on screenings for breast cancer by the United States Preventive Task Force has elicited this hearing, I hope, will bring some clarity, which I feel is needed on both sides. And I thank you for holding it. I've only read the executive su summary, but I have several questions, like why now? Did the task force not foresee the reaction that has occurred? And why was it just released as an article, uh, as important it is, as it is, and not at a briefing with press and stakeholder organizations? As an African-American woman who's had friends and family diagnosed in their 20s, their 30s, and 40s, many with no known risk factors, some with good outcomes, and others who died because of the aggressiveness of their disease, and as a physician who knows the pain of caring for women, who came to care very 
late stage, with very late stage carcinomas, like the 24 black women who are going to be reported on shortly, diagnosed in this city by Dr. Wayne Fedrick, the head of the Cancer Center at Howard, in a recent 18 month period, 24. I'm not pleased to say the least with the reports not specifically addressing those of us who die most often from this disease. Mammograms are not perfect and perhaps least so in the 40 to 49 age group, but as part of the, the full armamentarium, the mammogram um, in the full part of the full armamentarium, it is the best we have today. We've never told women that mammograms are all that there is. As Dr. Frederick of Howard said, and Ms. Lorray and Dr. Brawley will attest, our main concern ought to be, in prevention, our main concern ought to be the gaps in outcomes and the lack of access of many women to mammograms, exams, and other screening and diagnostic modalities. And while this is most evident in the uninsured, co-pays create almost equal barriers to women with insurance. And neither is the federal government doing enough. As an example, the Virgin Islands scored very high on the breast and cervical cancer grant application, but was never funded. There's inadequate funding to meet the need. Until every woman has access, you can well imagine that we will not welcome, the, I will not welcome anyway, these kinds of narrow recommendations. What's next, colonoscopy, colonoscopy screening? For colon cancer, it probably saved my life and not having one has caused me to lose too many friends. The task force is independent, which I consider a good thing. It's also very important to base decisions like, and recommendations like these on science. But the task force is not as diverse as it needs to be to adequately and appropriately address the health care needs of all Americans. The recommendations may have been very different or at least more expansive if some of the recommendations that the American Cancer Society offered had been accepted. They're similar to ones that we recommended for H.R. 3962. But I welcome everyone, all of the panelists today and I look forward to the testimony. I thank the gentlewoman. Uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> for convening this hearing. On November 16, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force released its updated breast cancer screening recommendations for women in the general population. Several of the recommendations have since caused widespread confusion and concern, primarily its recommendations for women age 40 to 49. The task force recommended against routine screening mammography in women age 40 to 49, but did say that certain patients in this age range, based on individual factors, should be screened. This is a change from the task force, force's 2002 recommendation that all women age 40 and older receive screening mammography every one to two years. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force was first convened by the Public Health Service in 1984, and since 1998, <clears throat> it has been sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, a division of the Department of Health and Human Services. It is instructive, therefore, to pay attention to what the Secretary of Health and Human Services had to say about the task force recommendations. On November 19, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius said, quote, my message to women is simple. Mammograms have always been an important life-saving tool in the fight against breast cancer, and they still are today. Keep doing what you have been doing for years. Talk to your doctor about your individual history, ask questions, and make the decision that is right for you." End quote. Basically, she told women to ignore the task force recommendations. The good news for women age 40 to 49 is that they can talk to their doctors and determine whether or not routine mammograms are best for them. The bad news is that if the House passed health reform bill, H.R. 3962 becomes law, a woman in that age range may not be allowed to have a mammogram. The House passed reform bill renames the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force the Task Force on Clinical Preventive Services. As part of the bill's essential benefits package, preventive services, including those services recommended with a grade of A or B by the task force on clinical preventive services must be covered. But according to the task force's just release recommendations, routine mammograms for women age 40 to 49 received only a grade C. Should the health reform bill become law, the new task force will make recommendations to the Health Benefit Advisory Committee, 
which will determine what is and is not covered in the essential benefits package. I think we should ask ourselves how likely it is that one government board, the Health Benefits Advisory Committee, will recommend including services in the essential benefits package that another government board, the task force, has recommended not be covered. It is important to note that all private plans in the exchange will have to meet the essential benefits package, but they cannot exceed it. A private insurer cannot add additional benefits above and beyond what the government requires in the essential benefits package except to premium plus plans and then only if the added benefit is approved by the Health Benefits Commissioner. So, for example, if the essential benefits package did not cover routine mammograms for women aged 40 to 49, insurance plans would be forbidden from covering them. My state of Pennsylvania requires that all plans cover mammograms for women aged 40 to 49. If this bill were to become law and the Secretary were to adopt these breast cancer screening recommendations as is, as part of the essential benefits package, Pennsylvania would either have to change its benefit mandate law or reimburse the government for the added cost of screening this population. These recommendations should be a wake-up call that government-run health care will come between patients and their doctors. I look forward to hearing our distinguished witnesses. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. The gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much for uh, the hearing today because it not only gives us an opportunity to further understand the recommendations as to breast cancer screening, but, uh, screening, but it affords us an opportunity to raise awareness about the real issue uh, involving women's health in America, and that's access to care, plain and simple. Uh, for women in America, access to care, affordable health care, uh, including screenings of all kinds, eclipses the debate over what age uh, women and their doctors should begin routine mammograms. Uh, for millions of women across America, this debate has no application whatsoever. They're not receiving screenings at age 50. They're not receiving screenings at age 60. Uh, they simply do not have access to affordable health care because our health care system in this country is broken. Uh, it's very basic. We know that if you do not have affordable health care, you are less likely to receive the vital preventative screenings that uh, women with insurance have. <clears throat> the American Cancer Society reports that in my home state of Florida, if you don't have health insurance, uh, you're simply not going to receive any screening of whatsoever. You, women in this country just do not have uh, access to affordable, affordable care. Maybe one quarter of women in the state of Florida that do not have health insurance will receive some mammogram uh, during the age 40, age 40 to 60. And it is much worse if you're African American or Latina. Uh, the disparities in screenings, diagnosis, treatment exist, and I think this is the critical issue that Donna uh, Christensen has raised that really deserves a great deal of attention and debate, and it is the proper place for our outrage over, the, over women's health in America because regardless of your insurance status, if you're African American, uh, you are 1.9 times more likely to be diagnosed with an advanced stage of breast cancer than white women, and Hispanic women are almost one and a half times more likely to be diagnosed uh, than white women. So the real concern here and the proper place for our outrage is access to care in and of itself. Our broken system prevents millions of women in America from even being part of this debate over screening. Fortunately, uh, due to the efforts of many over the past year, we are on the road to correcting uh, this problem. And I hope that that we can focus on the true issues of our broken health care system in America that affects, yes, breast cancer screening, but really is the heart, is the heart of the problem on, on, in our fight to making America a healthier country. Thank you. Thank the gentlewoman. Um, next is the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, science is a whole host of disciplines, and math is one of them. 
And when you look at what the task force recommendations uh, have done, uh, it is absolutely disingenuous to say cost didn't play a role in it. Uh, let me quote you from the American Cancer Society. Uh, the task force says that screening 1,339 women in their 50s to save one life makes screening worthwhile at that age. Yet the task force also says that screening 1,904 women ages 40 to 49 in order to save one life is not worthwhile. When you look at their, uh, their executive summary, clinical breast examination specifically talks about costs, the principal cost of a, of a CBE is the opportunity cost incurred by clinicians in the patient encounter. Clearly cost is a consideration. They did it with digital mammography. Digital mammography is more expensive than film mammography and talks about the cost benefit analysis of that as they work their way through. Magnetic re, uh, resonance imaging. Magnetic resonance imaging is much more expensive than either film or digital mammography. To say that cost was not a factor in this is not being honest. It's just not. It clearly was the reason. And to say, well, they don't have any authority, wait till that insurance company comes out and says, well, we based it on this task force, a government task force recommendation, says I don't have to pay for mammography for a woman between ages of 40 and 49. That's where we're going. Matter of fact, in your 2,000-page bill, that's exactly what you do. The Health Benefit and Advisory Committee is created to do exactly that. And how do we know that? Because the National Institute of Clinical Effectiveness, the NICE board in Great Britain, is the very organization that limits things like pap smears. They raised it from 23 to 25 for young women. Why? Why did they do it? Because science told them? Nope. To save money. And what the math part of your science equation is, we think that we're willing to accept that more women will be diagnosed later on in or later stages of cancer we're willing to accept the higher mortality rate to save money that's what this report says and that's what we're getting ready to foist on the american people that is not a scare tactic that's reality and it happens in great britain and it happens in canada and it happens in france and what we are saying is we can and should do better i am a cancer survivor because of early screening I know Mr. Blunt is a cancer survivor because of early screening. Why we would foist this kind of an ugly system and hide behind the fact that we will have more deaths, more mortality because of cancer, because of it, is beyond me. What we're saying is this 2,000-page this bill and its 118 new boards, commissions, and other government agencies that will dictate your health care policy is wrong. And we can and we should, by these women in their 40s, do much better. And I would yield back the remainder of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Next is, uh, I'm a, having a hard time seeing who's here. Uh, the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for moving so quickly to convene a, a hearing on the recommendations of the Preventive Services Task Force. I appreciate it. This committee has talked a lot about the need for evidence-based science over the last year, but it is important, particularly when it comes to something as critical as breast cancer screenings, that we do look carefully into the justification for these recommendations and their ramifications for individual women. Many of my constituents have questions, as do I, and I look forward to, uh, to asking them. But I do want to say right now that this is not something that should become a political football or, in my view, an attack on the need for health reform that guarantees access to comprehensive health care for women. We all want to uh, ensure women, especially women threatened with, uh, life, uh, with, with life threatening diseases like breast cancer, and make sure that they have access to the health care that they need with, uh, without pre existing condition exclusions, gender rating denials that exist today. But uh, among the, the questions that have been asked is how do we reduce the number of unnecessary screens while ensuring that we do not provide disincentives? for mammograms that will save women's lives. 
How do we empower women to ask for a screening when they suspect a problem? How do we build on what we know today to ensure that we're getting the research and science around breast cancer prevention and treatment right? What improvements are needed to obtain more accurate screens? How do the grades provided by the task force mesh with its recommendation that doctors and their patients be allowed to make individual choices, particularly when it comes to high-risk women? And how do we make sure that inadequate insurance coverage or high cost cost sharing doesn't pre don't prevent barriers to screening and all appropriate follow-up care. Women across the country are, getting, are, are concerned about getting access to mammograms and other essential services. And women's groups across the nation have endorsed comprehensive health reform for this very reason, because they know that millions of women's lives depend on it. I'm eager to hear from our witnesses and discuss the task, force, task force's recommendation. And again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from uh, Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Uh, I want to also thank you for holding this hearing so quickly on this important topic. Um, I I believe I have mentioned to this committee before that my oldest sister is a 20-year breast cancer survivor, so I have a keen interest in this topic. Uh, the breast cancer treatment guidelines released on November 16th by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force have created a firestorm across the country, giving rise to concerns about women's access to life-saving screening. Some have commented that these recommendations are merely guidelines for insurance company, companies and government officials trying to access to assess the relative value of mammography, clinical breast exams, and breast self-exams. In a written statement, How Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius said the guidelines had caused a great deal of confusion and worry among women and their families across this country and stressed that they were issued by, quote, an outside independent panel of doctors and scientists who do not set federal policy and don't determine what services are covered by the federal government. I am here to tell you today and to tell every woman in America that under this bill, H.R. 3962, which has already passed this Congress, that statement will not be true. Indeed, under this bill, the recommendation of this task force would become binding law. And if so, it would be devastating to access to mammograms and nothing short of catastrophic for women's health in this country. In their recent report, uh, mammograms for women aged 40 to 49 were given a grade of C. Under this bill, any procedure given a grade of less than A or B cannot be covered by the public plan. So the women that my colleague worried about who have no access to care today for mammograms could not legally get mammograms once this bill becomes law. The panel also found insufficient evidence to determine whether it's worth screening women over the age of 74. Again, because the grade was neither an A nor a B, it was an I, insufficient, under this bill, those women could not get mammogram screaming legally under any public plan. But it's important to understand precisely how far this bill goes, because it does not just prohibit mammogram screaming if this were the finding of this same task force after HR 3962 becomes law. It would prohibit private insurers make it illegal for private insurers to provide mammogram coverage to women in these age groups. That's what the law says. Let me explain. Under the House bill, private insurers can offer four health plans. One, a basic plan. Two, an enhanced plan. Three, a premium plan. And four, a premium plus plan. Under Section 303 of H.R. 3962, Women purchasing insurance under the first three categories, basic, enhanced, or premium, would not be allowed to purchase because the insurance company would not be allowed to offer a policy covering mammogram uh, services. That's right, it would be illegal for a private insurance company 
in any one of those first three categories, basic, enhanced, or premium, to offer coverage for mammograms because mammograms were not given either an A or a B rating. With regard to the top category, premium plus, a plan, an insurance company could offer coverage for mammograms, but if and only if the Health Choice Commissioner specifically allowed the policy to cover mammograms. Now, I don't suspect that many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle understand that aspect of this bill, and I hope that before this bill or anything like it were to become law, they would study it closely and recognize what is wrong with it, certainly having the government prohibit people who choose to, to be able to buy a mammogram coverage is not what was intended by the authors of this legislation. But in fact, that's what the bill does. The government would prohibit millions of women from buying coverage for mammograms. The government would, prohibit, would forbid private plans from offering man 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 mammogram coverage to millions of women. Poor and middle class Americans, by force of law, would be prohibited from getting mammogram coverage under the insurance exchange. Gentleman is two minutes over. I've let created you go in this on. bill. I thank like the gentleman him. for his Please. indulgence and hadn't realized I'd gone over time. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this this hearing. I expect we're going to hear a lot about um, rationing today from the other side. Uh, to me, the discussion today isn't about rationing. It's about being rational in looking at all of the evidence that's available to us and making smart decisions about what kind of treatment we should deploy and what kind of coverage there should be. And I think the jury is out on this. That's why we're, we're having the hearing. There have been recommendations that have been put forward. Uh, they appear to me to be based on very extensive studies, research, um, and science. And I think uh, we ought to approach them with an open, uh, with an open mind. I'm glad we're having this hearing. I think this is exactly the kind of thing we should be doing. And um, the fact of the matter is that as science advances, um, it causes us to revisit uh, treatment. And that's a good thing. Now, there may be other considerations at play here. One of them is clearly the high um, attention that there is to uh, mammography screening and the education effort that has gone on with women across this country uh, to make them more sensitive to this uh, as a screening tool. So all of those considerations ought to be fed into the mix. And I would expect that the Secretary of HHS will be considering all of those things uh, going forward. Uh, but to put our head in the sand and not look at the science, it seems to me, uh, would be a serious mistake. So we ought to, we ought to review these, these recommendations with a sober and dispassionate uh, consideration. I think that's what we're called upon to do. Um, I would assume that that's what the Health Benefits Advisory Committee uh, would do in receiving recommendations from any other government body. The notion that that one government, and we've heard this theme again as well today, the notion that, that one government body uh, will accept without any kind of independent judgment or review the recommendations of another government body, I don't think um, uh, makes any sense. I think that the Health Benefits Advisory Committee will look at all the factors in determining uh, what ought to be uh, the policy when it comes uh, to treatment. So I think this is a good conversation to be having, and, and um, I thank the, the uh, Commission for putting the recommendations forward, for basing them on science, and now we're going to have to uh, consider those in the light of many, many factors in judging how to, um, how to move forward. So I, I look forward to the, uh, to the testimony of the witnesses, and I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. A uh, gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to say thank you so much to our witnesses for being here. I am 
really appreciative of the opportunity for us to have this hearing today. And I have a formal statement I will submit for the record, but I do want to make a few comments as we began this. This is an issue of tremendous concern to me. I think that all of us are concerned about the welfare and the health of women. We're concerned about what you all as the task force brought forward. Uh, sure, we're concerned about the science, and I want to discuss with you that science, where you drew that from and your process. I also want to explore with you your task force structure and look at the linkages that you bear and what would happen if H.R. 3962 were to be passed and read into law? You all have a portfolio of 105 topics. That gets to the heart of the issue. Because when you start reading on H.R. 3962 on page 1296 into Title III, and you look at Section 2301 of this bill, the decisions you make do end up having the weight of law placed behind them. And when you read specifically on pages 1317 and 1318, you see exactly what is going to happen with your recommendations. And then you go in and you look at how it becomes the standard of the law. So I encourage everyone to take this bill down and read it. And read that title. Look at section 3101. Look at section 2301. Go back and look on pages 110 to 112 at how what you do and how you give priority and preference to certain treatments and certain categories is going to carry the weight of law. Now, it is of concern to me when I hear statements made by members of Congress that we are going to deploy certain treatments or certain health care. That ability should rest with the patient and their physician. We do not need a bureaucrat in that exam room. And yes, indeed, when you read this bill, we do have concerns that it will lead to rationing because the decisions appear that they're being made on cost and not on health care. So I welcome you all. I appreciate your time. We're going to have a lengthy number of questions. And Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time. Thank the gentlewoman. Chairman Dingell, gentleman from Michigan. I flew back this morning from Michigan hoping to have a rather informed hearing on a very important point. I find that I have come back to listen to some fairy tales coming from the other side of the aisle. And I find myself offended by the lack of attention that my Republican colleagues have given to the health bill. And I find myself very much affronted to listen to the kind of distorted logic and reasoning with which I am being afflicted as I enter this room. Now, I have great affection and respect for my friends on the other side of the aisle. And I'm willing to assume that their behavior this morning in making the comments I'm hearing about these recommendations and how they will play with the bill is bottomed on a lack of attention, study, knowledge, or diligence in understanding either the bill or the recommendations of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. It's been a little bit like listening to the fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. But to set the record straight, I want my colleagues to understand that the bill does not, in its provisions, behave as my Republican colleagues would have us believe. It does not use these kinds of recommendations to suppress treatment or interfere with the relationship between the patients and the doctors. This is the kind of scare tactics that I have heard from that side of the aisle, with always with great personal offense. They talked about how we're going to pull the plug on grandma, how we're going to push euthanasia forward. 
how we're going to deny health care to deserving people because of this legislation. These recommendations that we're going into this morning are recommendations, nothing more. And to say anything different than that is either to transmit the grossest kind of carelessness, or I, and I hope this is not the case, or just plain outright deceit. It is time for us to look at these recommendations as they are. The recommendation of a scientific panel created to make advice on what is the best medical practice and how we can see to it that we best protect our women with regard to things like pap smears and mammograms. Now, I'll yield to no one on either subject because this committee and the oversight subcommittee, when I was chairman of each, were responsible for seeing to it that both mammograms and pap smears were made in the safest way for the benefit of patients. I lost a mother to cervical cancer, and I've lost lots of friends to breast cancer and other things. And I am grossly affronted by the statements that I've heard coming from the other side, in which they tell us how these recommendations and the health bill on which we are working so hard are going to deny women mammograms, proper mammography, and pap smear, and other needed services. That is offensive. It is just plain wrong. It is absolutely false. And I would urge my friends on the other side to go off and take a look at the bill, to read it carefully, and if they need any assistance in understanding what the bill does, I will be happy to volunteer to provide time so that they may come to have a better understanding of what the bill does, and they may then make more informed statements on these matters. We need to deal with our health problems in a responsible way. We need to see to it that we address the honest defects which are in the bill, but not to manufacture a lot of fears and faults which do not exist. I am affronted, Mr. Chairman, and I hope that this record and this hearing will correct some of the unfortunate misapprehensions and misstatements that have been flowing thickly from the other side of the aisle this morning. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, our ranking member, a gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Chairman Pallone, for holding this hearing. I listened with great affection and with great interest to my good friend from Michigan, former chairman and current chairman emeritus Dingell's opening statement. I think it goes without saying the uh, personal esteem and the professional respect that I have for him. Having said that, there are no fairy tales being told on this side of the aisle this morning. Um, here's the bill to pass the House. I want to, in this bill, on page 1762, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is given the authority, and I quote, to determine the frequency the population to be served, and the procedure or technology to be used for breast cancer screenings covered under the Indian Health Service. In Section 303, the legislation states, and I quote, the commissioner shall specify the benefits to be made available under the exchange participating health plans, end quote. In plain English, Mr. Chairman, what this means is that the new Health Choices Commissioner will determine what preventive services, including mammography, are covered under the health insurance that's based, uh, that's in this bill. Now, we also know that the U.S. Preventive Task Force is an outside independent council 
of doctors and scientists who make recommendations. They do not set federal policy and they don't determine what services are to be covered by the bill, but their recommendations are going to be seriously listened to. Now, I have an aunt who passed away in her early 50s as a consequence of breast cancer. I have a sister who was diagnosed with breast cancer in her 30s, luckily received proper treatment, had a mastectomy, and so far uh, for the last 10 years is, is cancer free. I have a wife, beautiful wife, who's under the age of 50, and she has annual mammograms every year. I have a good friend who was just diagnosed with breast cancer, who's in her mid-40s. Again, she's undergoing treatment. Hopefully, she's going to have a good outcome. To have a task force make the recommendation that has been made and to have in this bill the authority that's given to various unelected bureaucrats to make health care decisions, including coverage and frequency, in my opinion, is wrong. It's wrong. Now, on a bipartisan basis, this subcommittee and the full committee repeatedly has passed bills increasing and supporting the early detection of breast cancer, the prevention, the research. I mean, we do it almost every Congress. So, we're starting down a path, in my opinion, of socialization of medicine in this country with the passage of this bill out of this committee, with its passage on the House floor, its waiting approval in the Senate. This is an excellent time to hold this hearing. I appreciate the chairman and the full ranking, full chairman, subcommittee and full committee chairman's personal attendance. But let's don't talk about fairy tales. Let's talk about the facts, the plain English of these bills. And if we continue to agree rhetorically, then we need to begin to make substantive changes in the legislation to prevent what we all say we oppose. We don't want rashing of health care in America. We don't want to intervene between the doctor-patient relationship. We don't want young, young women or for that matter, more mature women over the age of 74 developing breast cancer because they're not allowed a, mam a mammogram. My good friend to my right, Mr. Rogers of Michigan, had a, an amendment that was passed at committee that explicitly prevented the rationing of care, and it mysteriously disappeared in the bill that got reported out of the Rules Committee. In the dark of the night, some staffer on the majority side, or maybe a member, I don't know, decided that the, the will of the committee didn't mean anything. It disappeared. Maybe we need to put that back in. I don't know. So, I have great respect for this committee. I have great respect for the leadership on the committee. But let's don't talk about fairy tales when we can read these bills. Now, I'm not saying the bill's a fairy tale, but I will say the bill is not reflective of the policy that members on both sides of the aisle say they support. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Next is um, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, um, I appreciate the opportunity that you have and so quickly dealing with this. First of all, I, I want to thank the Chairman Emeritus for his offer for the uh, Chairman Dingell willing to conduct a class on remedial health care comprehension. And my only question is, is it going to be uh, mandatory or permissive? Um, and uh, hearing my colleagues on the other side talk about unelected bureaucrats, unelected insurance companies do this every day, right now. And I'll give you an example. When I moved to be a member of Congress, my wife um, 
had been getting annual mammograms, and yet our new insurance in Congress refused it after the first year. And she was a survivor. Her mom was a 40-year survivor of uh, breast cancer. And so she fit the exception. And it took me as a member of Congress saying, I can't practice law, but believe me, I will file suit against my, our carrier if they don't continue to pay for those mammograms. You have to fight for the care that you want. And to say that the House bill that passed would set up this unelected group to do it, it all rests on our shoulders. And I think that decision ought to be made by elected officials. Now, this group will take recommendations from every, uh, everyone, but ultimately it's going to be our decision and will continue to provide legislation to have minimum benefits. And the statement I have, uh, the, in 2002, the task force changed their breast cancer screening to a grade B to recommend mammograms every one to two years for women 40 to 75. That was only seven years ago. And yet now the task force is making a change. Two weeks ago, they revised it and made it a grade C. The, uh, and that, that's the issue, I think, that my colleagues are talking about, uh, that, that, that women under, or at age of 40 would not be automatic but should not be denied. And again, it does go back to the doctor and the patient's decision. And I have, in fact, doctors on both sides. I have doctors tell me all the time that they have battles with insurance companies saying we need to do this and the insurance company won't allow it. And, uh, and they're the ones that are practicing medicine. And that's a battle that has to be fought every day no matter what happens if we pass a national health care bill. But to use this opportunity to pick at the national health care bill I think is, uh, is interesting because the task force was, will be uh, given the opportunity to clarify their statements and I'm glad we have the testimony here today. The adverse reactions to the poor wording of the task force recommendation obviously has not gone unnoticed by our committee and the members of the committee. In fact, I contacted uh, and we've been contacted by a number of constituents in my district, including MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center in Houston about the recommendations. They were very public. They're opposed to the task force recommendations. They'll continue to recommend it along with many, many other groups. And luckily the state of Texas has a mandate that all private insurers must cover annual breast cancer screenings beginning at the age of 40, but this new screening recommendations will cause some access problems for bar uh, barriers for women. The topic is also especially sensitive because the reform bill 3962 states that the U.S. Preventative Task Force recommendations A and B are mandated benefits and the bill also includes report language saying A and B recommendations for the fl are a floor for benefits, not a ceiling. The A and B are a floor. So the task force recommendation will be considered that, but the decision could be made still whether, no matter what the task force says. So that's what we're here today to talk about. I have concerns about jeopardizing access to preventative screenings for women, especially since I represent a majority Latino district that's medically underserved, and I've worked for years in Congress to expand the coverage of mammograms in our community and pr for primary and preventative care services. I like the fact that the task force is an independent commission and is designed to keep politics out of medical recommendations uh, because I can be an expert for 30 seconds on anything, but I do depend on the experts to be able to make uh, those decisions. And again, I look forward to the testimony, Mr. Chairman, and I ask for the answer to consent to my full statement to be placed into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Green. Next is the gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Myrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding the hearing today. Uh, I understand that scientifically and statistically this report information is not new and I know that mammography is not perfect um, by any stretch of the imagination, but I want to talk to it, this um, whole report from the preventive side um, because to me it's sending the wrong message to women. It's saying you don't have to be vigilant. You don't have to take care of yourself. You don't have to do preventive care. And the reason that concerns me is I'm a 10-year breast cancer survivor. I'm one of those that uh, w w persevered, literally, to find, you know, my own cancer because I knew something was wrong with my body. Um, and I had, um, you know, good doctors who helped me. But um, because of that, I'm here today. And we all know that earlier detection means 
longer survivals. I mean, that's a no-brainer. So many women really say to me, I don't want to get a mammogram, it hurts, you know, or whatever, I just don't want to do it. I heard that over and over again ever since I started to get active on this issue. And then a lot of women have told me, I don't want to know. You know, I really don't want to know if I have cancer. Well, my whole point in this is, you know, you better find out sooner rather than later because of what I said before. So I'm very concerned that, that we are saying, hey, you don't have to take care of yourself. Women look for an excuse not to do this anyway and not to do self-exams. Um, and especially, you know, younger women today, there are so many younger women in my area that are in 20s and 30s getting breast cancer, they have their own support group. And that never used to happen. So when we talk about what we need to do, I hope that we will very seriously consider that, you know, the, and I'm glad the panel's going to be here to explain what, why they did what they did. Um, but I know that some of the groups are going to continue to recommend they do the same thing. And with digital mammography now, things have changed, uh, especially with younger women. So, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate this opportunity very much and um, just to look forward to hearing the recommendations from the com uh, panel. Thank you. Gentlewoman from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, appreciate your uh, calling this hearing of the Health Subcommittee to discuss what is both a deeply personal uh, and deeply political issue for myself and, as you've heard, many of our colleagues in this room. The United States Preventative T uh, Services Task Force was authorized by Congress to deliver recommendations regarding the efficacy of clinical preventative services. Ideally, these recommendations will be used to inform primary medical care. On November 16th, the task force delivered new recommendations regarding breast cancer screenings, incorporating the most extensive scientific evidence available. Among their more controversial findings were the grade C recommendation for mammography in women over 40, which means that because the science does not point to any significant harm or tremendous benefit, that the provision of the services should be a decision between an individual and her doctor. An independent, rigorous examination of the science behind clinical preventative services is an essential part of delivering effective health care. The task force was doing its job. And uh, as they may admit today, they could have done much more around such a sensitive topic by educating and explaining their recommendations to women across the country. They could have engaged community and advocacy groups to be messengers of this information rather than combatants. Moving forward with additional recommendations in sensitive areas, I would encourage them to do just that. I came away from this report and the surrounding controversy with two additional thoughts that I would like to quickly share. First, we clearly need better screening and diagnostic tools. Mammography is not a precise enough tool. We need advancements in technology that can help us understand what conditions require further tests, what requires treatment, and how we can best help women live long and healthy lives. Some of these advancements in technology are being developed in my home state of Wisconsin. Tools to help us identify types of tissue with more precision, improving the efficacy of an x-ray screening for breast cancer. My second point is that we urgently and desperately need health care reform. We must ensure that every woman and every American has access to a regular source of care. If the best approach is to discuss the option of mammography or other screening with your doctor, you have to have a doctor. The villain here is the lack of coverage and access to care. Otherwise, uh, women who are shut out of the health care system, whether by stigma or lack of resources or even abusive and discriminatory insurance industry practices, these women have the potential of dying of breast cancer or other conditions before we even have a chance to intervene. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing us this venue to discuss and clarify this critical topic. It has bearing not only on the health of women, but the health of all Americans. Thank you. Gentlewoman, gentlewoman, gentlewoman from uh, Colorado, Ms. Degay. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll submit my full statement for the record. Um, I, I just, I just want to say that, um, uh, as Mr. Sarbane said, we've got to look at science here, and we've got to look at the recommendations based on science. Which, you know, sometimes I feel revolutionary in Congress saying that, but, but that's what we need to look at. All of this, all of this uh, excitement on the other side of the aisle about how how these recommendations are going to be implemented. First of all, as Mr. Green said, it's, it's not a ceiling, it's just a floor. But secondly, even if they were implemented, most of them probably we wouldn't object to. The recommendations say, number one, the decision to initiate regular screening mammography in women aged 40 to 49 years should be an individual one, accounting for patient context and values rather than a population-wide recommendation for routine screening. That makes sense to me. Number two, biennial screening mammography for women aged 50 to 74 years. Number three, insufficient evidence to assess the additional benefits and harms of screening in women over 70, 75 years or older. And then the others. So really, if you actually look at the recommendations, they probably do make some sense from a scientific standpoint. But, but I've got to say, it is no wonder why the women of America are unbelievably confused as to what these recommendations are saying. Because what they are saying is, most women need to talk to their care provider and they need to figure out for themselves, based on their health and their family history, what is appropriate for them. There, it's not a one-size-fits-all testing. That makes sense to me. But if you look at, at the 24-hour news cycle, that's not what's being said to people. They're scared. They're confused. And when you add the misinformation that we hear from some of my friends on the other side, they're triply confused and scared because they think now when we have a health care plan that applies to everybody, suddenly they're going to be told that they don't need that they can't have tests that they need. And that is simply not the case. And so, so, Mr. Chairman, that's why I came down and sat through all the opening statements and I'm looking forward to the testimony because I think we really need to clear it up. What is it? that we are saying should be done with mammography and testing for women? And what is it that, that women need to be talking to their physicians about? Ultimately, it's going to be the, the decision of the physician and the woman what they need, and they need to figure that out, and then they need to feel secure that they're getting the level of testing that they need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlewoman. Uh, next is the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for taking the time to hold a hearing on this very important issue. Uh, cancer is a terrifying specter uh, for all Americans, and almost all of us have had a loved one or a friend who has been affected by it. Uh, it certainly is a disease that uh, strikes fear in the heart of all of us. And I want to preface my remarks by saying that I have heard some things uh, from the other side of the aisle that have made a lot of sense, and I uh, specifically uh, point to Congresswoman Myrick's comments, and uh, I find them very consistent with those just uh, uh, provided by uh, my colleague uh, from Colorado, Congresswoman DeGette. Uh, but we've heard some things from the other side of the aisle today that I think uh, cause us, or certainly cause me, uh, considerable concern. Uh, I think that it's wrong to use that fear that we all share of cancer to intimidate the people of this country into fear of comprehensive legislation that, as some of our witnesses will testify today, is good for people with cancer. Uh, in following up with some of the remarks made by uh, Chairman Dingell, there are some things this bill does not do that need to be clarified. Uh, these task force recommendations will not lead to rationing care. Uh, that is simply not true. Uh, and I think that it's tactics like these that weaken the faith of the American people, not in any one particular party, but in the institution of Congress. 
Uh, nothing in this legislation prohibits insurers from covering mammograms. In fact, the legislation gives the Secretary leeway to add to the minimum benefits package as needed. I think it is disingenuous to, on the one hand, defend a status quo which sees insur the insurance industry every day making decisions about the lives of their insureds based on financial, strictly financial considerations. Uh, and then, on the other hand, condemn a system uh, because you speculate that these kinds of recommendations will lead to the rationing of care. Uh, second, what this bill does do is it provides the benefit of insurance to millions of Americans that don't have it. And following on with what Dr. Christensen mentioned earlier, it's not just those Americans that don't have insurance that will benefit from this bill when it comes to preventative care and access to mammograms. It's those who have insurance but can't afford the copayments, specifically those who are uh, indigent or middle class Americans, that that makes a difference for them. Uh, this bill makes preventative care a basic and fundamental right for every American. Uh, that means, again, that my, my constituents, the 65,000 of them that have no access to coverage right now and tens of thousands more who can't afford copays, will now have access uh, to things like mammograms when they wouldn't uh, have otherwise had that. Uh, these are questions uh, that we all should be asking. What is the net benefit of this legislation to our constituents? Uh, rather than jumping to irrational conclusions, adding confusion to the public, and politicizing an issue which should transcend politics, we should be asking these rational questions, again, as my colleague from Maryland in indicates, based on reason and science. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you uh, once again for calling this hearing and yield back. Thank you. The uh, gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this extremely important hearing on the recommendations from the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force on Mammograms uh, for women in their 40s. Um, as we've all heard and has been discussed here, the task force is no longer recommending routine mammograms for women in their 40s. And as someone who cares deeply about women's health, I, like others, um, was surprised by this change. Breast cancer is, to say the least, a terrible disease. It's the leading cause of death for women between ages 20 and 59. We all know people who have been touched by breast cancer, people that we love and, and care about. And we all know people who have benefited from early detection. Um, so this is such an important hearing, and I look forward to hearing the discussion of the panel. And what the recommendations basically uh, are is that a woman should talk to their doctor or her doctor and make decisions accordingly for their care. But many women, as has been pointed out, don't have doctors. And many women don't have access to health care. And women who should get mammograms either under the old recommendations or the new recommendations do not get the mammograms. In 2007, only 70% 70, 70 of the women in the country who should have been screened for breast cancer were screened for breast cancer. And part of the reason women, whether they're 40 or they're 60, are not screened is because they do not have insurance. And because they don't have insurance, they don't have access to the care that they need when they need it, including preventative care. So let's be clear that providing access to health insurance means providing access to preventative care, which means saving lives. So what's important is that patients and doctors are uh, able to uh, consult and access the care that that patient needs when that patient needs it. And that the patients and doctors together will decide the best course of care, whether that includes a mammogram. But in order to do that, people have to have access to doctors. Women of all ages under the uh, health care bill that has been passed by this House will have improved access to coverage. That should not be lost, and it certainly should not uh, discussions otherwise, representations otherwise, should not be used as we debate, debate and discuss this very important issue 
to derail efforts to give women access to the health care that they need in this country. Um, I don't think that that serves women well. I don't think that serves our country well. Uh, and frankly, I find it outrageous. And I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Brayley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this important hearing. I also want to commend my colleague, the gentlewoman from North Carolina, for her eloquent and thoughtful statement on a very important topic. And while I disagreed with what some of my colleague from Georgia said, I have great respect for his real-world experience on women's health issues and appreciate the concern he brought to this hearing. But I also want to talk about the comments that were made by the Chairman Emeritus and others on this committee. If people don't believe that rationing takes place right now in our private insurance system, every day, in every state, in every congressional district, they are sorely misguided. It does happen every day under the current system, which is failing to meet the needs of the American people. I'll give you a good example of a friend of mine who is diagnosed with prostate cancer and conferred with his physician on treatment options and agreed that proton beam therapy was the best choice of treatment for him. And he went to his private insurance company, which also is the Medicare administrator in my state of Iowa. And his treatment was denied on the basis that it was experimental. Well, guess what? Under the Medicare plan that that same private insurance company administered, it was considered non-experimental. And even though he was eligible for Medicare because of his age, he was still covered by a private plan through his employer and was denied coverage for the same treatment he would have gotten if he had been a member of Medicare. That's what's wrong with our broken health care delivery system. And that's why comparative effective research is, effectiveness research is such a critical part of a rational discussion about health care policy making. In an earlier uh, hearing in this same subcommittee, I talked about a hearing that took place in this very room years ago when a researcher advocating high-dose chemotherapy with bone marrow transplant for metastatic breast cancer patients was the only path to cure for those women, even though it had not been tested by rigorous academic research. Then, years after that, we came to the realization that many women were actually harmed and died because of being subject, subjected to that treatment. And th that is why, by the way, it is so important that the plain language amendment that I put in the health care bill be implemented in people dealing with health care issues. I think that in its position paper, um, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force highlights why that is so important. They indicate on uh, one page of their statement that the problem was a matter of communications because they did not say what the task force meant to say, that the communication of the mammography screening recommendations was poor. Well, I agree with that. And all you have to look is the next two sentences to find out why. This is what two of the sentences say. The we said is that screening starting at age 40 should not be automatic, nor should it be denied. That doesn't make sense. The next sentence says, what we are saying is that a decision to have a mammogram for women in their 40s should be based on a discussion between a woman, her doctor. If you don't communicate for your intended audience in language that they can comprehend easily, these barriers of communication between highly technical, scientific, and medical information will be a problem. But the debate we're having is a healthy debate about what the most effective use and treatment for breast cancer patients is, and that's what we need to focus on going forward. And I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman. Um, next is the uh, gentleman from Utah, Mr. Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief because I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, our two panels on this topic. Uh, in my state of Utah, the incident of breast cancer is lower than most states. However, our mortality rate is high because women in Utah are diagnosed in cancer's later stages. Uh, as a witness on our panel notes in his testimony, the recent recommendations provided by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force on November 16th have sparked concern and disagreement among providers, patients, families, as well as sparked a public discourse 
that has led to further confusion and anxiety. As we can see from the testimony before this committee, there is not consensus on screening protocols, but there does seem to be consensus that any screening and treatment discussion is an individual one between a provider and a patient. So I hope today's hearing can provide concrete information on the evidence-based decision-making processes of the task force. But I'm also interested to hear from the cancer community and medical providers on their next steps for outreach and patient education on the benefits and limitations of mammography screening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you. I believe that concludes the opening statements by members of the subcommittee. So we'll now turn to our witnesses, and if our first panel uh, would come forward, I would appreciate it. Thank you. We have two witnesses, uh, both from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Uh, to my left is Dr. Ned Collange, I hope I'm pronouncing it properly, who is chair of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. And uh, next to him is Dr. Diana uh, Petetti. Petiti? Petetti? Petiti, who is vice chair of the U.S. Uh, Preventive Services Task Force. Now, I'll just mention, as I think you know, that we have five-minute opening statements is from you. They become part of the record, and each of you may, in the discretion of the committee, submit additional statements in writing for inclusion in the record. And I would now recognize uh, first Dr. Collange. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. On behalf of our fellow task force members, we thank you for the opportunity to discuss the task force and our work. Our recently published recommendations on breast cancer screening have drawn a remarkable amount of attention. We recognize the communication of what the re recommendations say was poor, and the timing of the release was unfortunate. We wish to explain the process and timeline for creating these recommendations and to clarify what we intended to say to clinicians and women. The healthcare clinician scientists on the task force fully understand, most through personal experience, the impact of breast cancer on the lives of women and their families. Our job, though, is to rigorously review view scientific evidence. Politics play no part in our processes. Costs were never considered in our considerations. We voted on these recommendations long before the last presidential election. The timing of the release of the findings last month was determined not by us, but by the publication schedule of the Medical Research Journal, which peer-reviewed our work. The current task force was created by congressional mandate as an independent body with the mission of reviewing the scientific evidence for cl clinical, clinical preventive services and developing evidence-based recommendations for the healthcare community. Our primary audience for recommendations remains primary care clinicians. The task force has 16 volunteer termed members representing a diverse array of expertise in primary care and preventive health related disciplines, including adult, child preventive and behavioral medicine, women's health, nursing and research methods. The AHRQ director appoints members from the chair's recommendations developed from a public nomination process. Given the scope of topics covered, subspecialists who consult on or care for those identified through screening by primary care clinicians may not necessarily be recruited as members, but instead are consulted to review and comment on our work at critical points in the process. Our current portfolio includes a broad array of 105 clinical preventive services that are listed on our website. We strive to update topics every five years, which is what prompted the new breast cancer screening recommendations. To address the topic, designated task force work group members and scientists at an evidence-based practice center collaboratively develop an analytic framework and pertinent key questions. A structured, systematic review of evidence for each key question is conducted and a draft evidence report is created with work group consultation. Based on the evidence review and explicit methodology, the work group drafts a recommendation statement, and at an in-person meeting, the evidence and the draft statement are presented and discussed, and the task force votes on the recommendation. There is a careful attention to conflicts of interest, such that members with potential conflicts are recused from discussion and vote, or otherwise restricted in participation. Representatives of 24 partner organizations, including all primary care specialties, key federal agencies, and other key stakeholders specified in our written testimony and on our website, are invited to participate in the discussion. At three key points in the process, work products are sent for review and comment by the partner organizations, 
by subspecialty expert consultants from the relevant disease area, such as in oncologists, and by other stakeholders such as subspecialty professional organizations and advocacy groups. These products include the analytic framework and key questions, the draft systematic evidence review, and the draft recommendation statement as voted on. All comments are considered in creating the final products. Final recommendation statements and evidence reviews are published in peer-reviewed medical journals. Recommendations are expressed as letter grades based on two factors only, the magnitude of net benefit or balance of benefits and harms of providing the service and the scientific certainty about whether the service works. Cost and cost effectiveness are not addressed in our deliberations in making a recommendation. Over the past several years, we have discussed whether cost should ever influence a recommendation and we have repeatedly said no. For A and B recommendations, there are sufficient net health benefits such that primary care clinicians are recommended to provide these services for all appropriate patients. If there is no net benefit or there is net harm, we assign a D recommendation indicating to not provide the service. If gaps in the evidence prevent net benefit from being determined, we assign an I statement reflecting insufficient evidence indicating that more research is needed. Finally, a C recommendation is assigned when there is a small net benefit. For C recommendations, we recommend the patient be informed about the potential benefits and harms and then be supported in making his or her own informed choice about, about being tested. The specific C language that we recommend against routine provision was intended for consideration by primary care clinicians, but unfortunately has played out in unintended ways in the public interpretation of the breast cancer recommendation. Congress through Public Law Section 915 mandates that AHRQ convene the task force to address our mission. The role of AHRQ in the process is to support our activities and processes, but AHRQ staff and the director of AHRQ do not vote or otherwise influence our decisions. I will have to admit to the committee that breast cancer is of particular concern to me. I lost both my mother-in-law to breast cancer and my sister is currently undergoing therapy. I fully understand this issue and have to rely on the science as we provide our recommendations. With that, I would like to turn testimony over to uh, Dr. Petiti to testify specifically about the breast cancer screening recommendation. Um, I I'm sorry, I just wanted to thank Dr. Colonge and now uh, ask Dr. Petiti to uh, begin. Well, I'm Diana Petiti. I'm the Vice Chair of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. I'm a physician and an epidemiologist. I have spent my entire 32-year career as a scientist working on issues of women's health. Um, I've published on the topic of mammography screening. I served as uh, vice chair of the National Cancer Policy Board, and I have expertise in evidence synthesis, systematic review, and meta-analysis. I participated in this process from the very beginning. I would not sign off on any recommendation that I did not believe um, reflected the best possible use of evidence for the benefit of women. Um, I appreciate the opportunity um, to clarify for members of this subcommittee the task force recommendations and the evidence and weighing of the evidence that led to these recommendations. In specific, the task force recommends the following. Women age 50 through 74 should have mammography every other year. The decision to start regular biannual screening mammography before the age of 50 should be an individual one and take the patient context into account, including the patient's values regarding specific benefits and harms. That is, the task force is saying that screening starting at 40 should not be automatic, nor should it be de denied. Many doctors and many women, perhaps even most women, will decide to have mammography screening starting at age 40. The task force supports those decisions. The task force acknowledges that the language used to describe its C-grade recommendation about breast cancer screening for women 40 to 49 did not say what the task force meant to say. The task force communication was poor. The task force is committed, really committed, to improving its communication. The task force first addressed the screening mammography topic in 1989. At that time, the task force recommended screening women 40 through 50 through 75 every one to two years. With regard to screening younger women, 
The task force stated it may be prudent to begin screening at an earlier age for women at high risk of breast cancer. In its 1996 guide, the task force recommendation was in favor of screening women 50 to 59 every one to two years. Mammography screening for women 40 to 49 was given a C grade. At that time, a C grade recommendation meant insufficient evidence. In 2002, the task force recommended screening women 40 to 69 every one to two years, stating that the benefits were smaller and took longer to emerge for women who were first screened in the 40s. On November 16th, as this committee knows, the task force issued its updated recommendations and, uh, on breast cancer service, services. I wish first to clarify that the timing of issuance of these recommendations. In late 2006, discussion of a plan for updating the recommendation began. The breast cancer topic came up for review at the regularly scheduled time. Work on the topic started in 2007. When the top recommendation statements came up for a vote in November 2007, the members could not come to agreement about what to recommend because of agreement about what to say about the balance of benefits and harms. In this context, the task force asked for additional evidence from its evidence-based practice center. The task force considered this evidence at its July 14 to 15, 2000 meeting. In making its final recommendation, the task force considered evidence identified in a systematic review of evidence for six key questions, the results of an analysis from the breast cancer screening consortiums and the results of a study commissioned by the task force and co conducted by the Cancer Interve Intervention and Surveillance Modeling Network. The systematic review re in, uh, identified almost 3,000 studies and 550 of these were used to make the recommendation. The final recommendations were made based on a weighing of the benefits and harms of screening mammography. The task force concluded from the evidence that screening mammography for women 40 to 64 has a benefit in reducing death due to breast cancer. The benefit is larger in older women than in younger women. And I'd like to speak specifically to the issue of harms in this net benefit equation. Preventive services are provided to asymptomatic individuals for the sole purpose of preventing or delaying morbidity, delaying functional decline, or postponing death. The promise of service delivery is net benefit, benefit minus harms. The benefits of mammography have been easy to communicate. The harms and potential harms have been difficult to communicate. The easily identifiable and commonly used definition of harm is physical injury. These physical injury direct harms are very, very small. But the task force considers as harms of a screening test not just physical harms, but psychological harms. Um, a great deal of disagreement of, of, of the controversy has centered on the task force use of and consideration of anxiety and psychological debt distress as a harm of a false positive test. In particular, the, the psychological distress has been ridiculed. To understand the consequences of false positive test, it is necessary to consider how women enter the screening cycle, what happens and what might happen to a woman who has a positive test. No matter how hard the concept of screening is explained, a positive mammogram screening test means cancer until cancer is proven not to exist. For some women who have a positive test, the time between a positive test and a statement there is no cancer is mercifully short. For other women, the follow-up involves more than one additional test, perhaps a clinical breast examination along with a test, a trip to a surgeon, over a period of time that is not always short and over a period of time it is unpredictable and not within the control of the woman. Some women eventually need a biopsy. Cancer is a terrifying prospect. It carries special emotional weight because of the consequences of the diagnosis have in the past involved not only death but the prospect of mutilating surgery. Anxiety and psychological distress in women who have had positive screening tests is amply documented in the evidence. The task force wants only that screening mammograms be done with full knowledge of these potential harms, the frequencies of these harms, and what is to be gained by being screened at an earlier compared with a later age. False positive tests are more frequent in younger than in older women. Um, other, false, other harms of mammography include ones that are less well documented, some women are diagnosed in their 40s with cancer that could have been treated just as well if diagnosed later. 
These women may have unnecessarily been exposed to the harms of treatment, including surgery, chemotherapy. And Doctor, I didn't want to. Yes. I didn't want to stop you because that's I, fine. Uh, so important, but you're two minutes over. I'm so sorry. keep going. But I'm only going to say that the um, the um, my final statement, and I'm, I'm mammography starting at 40 should not be automatic. The task force recommends that women in their 40s decide on an age to begin screen screening that is based on a conversation with their doctor and his individual. And I apologize for going over. Well, I'm going I'm to apologize for trying to stop you because it's so important that you clarify a lot of these things, and I, and I appreciate that. We, our pr procedure now is that we have questions uh, from uh, uh, the members of the of the panel. I mean, from the members of Congress, and I'll start with myself. Um, let me say that um, you've actually clarified some of the questions I was going to ask very well, but I still want to kind of review this, if I could, in my own mind. And if I say anything you disagree with, tell me. I'll, I'll t but I do want to ask you some questions as well. But I look. There's a lot of myths out there um, that have been spread. Um, both today and certainly in the last few weeks since you came out with your recommendations. And, and the way I understand it, uh, the current task force uses these ABC ratings. These are the same kind of ratings that would be used under the, the, ta the different task force that's in the uh, legislation, the larger health care reform legislation that we passed. In other words, you are the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, the new task force and the bill that we passed has a different name, clinical preventive services, but the A, B, and the C ratings are, 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 are the same or similar. But right now, these A, B, and C ratings have no force. Um, they're just recommendations. And um, what some of my colleagues have said is that these in insurance companies now don't have to cover A, B, or C. They don't have to cover anything. And in fact, what we're getting is that a lot of insurance companies right now don't cover don't prefer to cover any screenings because if you do a screening and they have to pay for treatment, it costs them money, which they try to avoid. And so what I see right now is that in some cases states have required certain screening, like my own state. Uh, but on the other hand, we heard the gentleman from Utah talk about Utah, where my understanding is they don't require any screenings. So uh, my, the point I'm trying to make is that the big advantage of the health care reform bill that we passed is that H.R. 3962 will, for the first time, create minimum standards for required preventative benefits. So private insurers would be required under that bill to cover services with a grade A or B recommendation. Right now, they don't have to cover anything. What we're doing in the bill is basically saying that, at a minimum, if you or your successor task force says that this is an A or B, it has to be required, which it's not now. The other thing uh, that we do in the bill is that we, we say that the secretary could require uh, a C rating also be covered under both a public option or private insurance plans. In fact, my understanding is that, that uh, the new task force, I mean the secretary under the bill, could even uh, require a C rating under the basic benefit package. Uh, now, that's contrary to what some of my colleagues have been saying on the, on the other side of the aisle. And my whole point here is to say that the truth is that if enacted into law, H.R. 3962 would result in a lot of people who are not getting mammograms, pap smears, uh, colonoscopies. A lot of people don't get that at all now because insurance companies basically don't have to do it unless the state requires it. Now, under this bill, they would have to do anything that you rate as an A or B, and the secretary could even require the C, either in the public option or in the private plan under the, under the basic benefit package. Now, I, I mention this because the bottom line is that women's ability to continue to obtain mammograms increases in these House and Senate bills that are being passed and are moved. And when I look at the Republican bill on the other side, it sets no floor whatsoever. There would be no minimum required benefits for insurance to provide under the Republican bill. Essentially, it would be just like the status quo that we have now. So I, 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 I don't know, you know, I listen to the debate that we've had today, and the bottom line is that the bill that we passed in this House provides a lot more coverage, has a lot more guarantees. The status quo doesn't provide any guarantees at the federal level, nor would the Republican alternative 
uh, that we have been given on the other side. Now, my question is, um, again, you mentioned that when you recommend a C, um, it says that it has a small net benefit and women are supposed to make their own decisions. So you made it quite clear today that even if it is a C, uh, there is some net benefit and the Secretary could decide under the new bill to say, okay, that is going to be required as well. Um, so you are not in any way um, with this C recommendation saying that this screening is not a good thing. In fact, you are actually saying there is a net benefit, but you would like individual women to make that decision with their doctor because it is only a small net benefit. I, is that accurate? If you well, would just explain Mr. it a little Chairman, better. I am going to speak to, to the science. Absolutely. And, and the science is that a C recommendation does mean net, a small net benefit. Right. And we map that C recommendation to advice that women make the decision with their doctors about whether or not to undergo skiing. I think, I think this committee is dealing with incredibly complicated issues about health reform and coverage, but the task force is not a coverage and health care reform and policy committee. We are scientists. But the bottom line is, and I will end with this, is that even when you recommend a C, you are saying there is a small net benefit. So, again, let us not talk about today, but let us talk about if the bill that we passed in the House and this committee becomes law. Even then, um, you know, the Secretary could say, okay, there is a small net benefit, and so we do want to require this as a basic benefit. Um, or, you know, you basically leave it up to the insurance companies to decide the way they do today. But, you know, the, the, the misinformation out there, I think, is that even under the bill that we passed, um, for, for, one, for once there is going to be a requirement that some of these screenings occur. If you rate it as an A, it has to be done. If you rate it as a B, it has to be done. If you rate it as a C, the Secretary can say it has to be done. Right now there is nothing, nothing at all. And uh, the Republicans and their alternative would continue the status quo that say you don't have to cover anything. And, and, and I just appreciate it because I think you have helped, helped me clarify it. I yield now to um, uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, because what we need in this country is a continued debate on the failed health care bill that we passed on the floor of the House. That, that's what we really need to do, and that's what we're doing today. Um, and we're using, obviously, what happened through um, your process to, to make the claim, the short-term concern of a public option, which many of my colleagues on the other side has said is the gateway to a one-payer system. So when the government controls all the health care decisions in this country, they will eventually default to control costs through rationed care. Now the process, the scientific process that you have just admitted to said there is a small net benefit. When there is increased decreased revenue available, the default will be based upon 3962, just what you say on your website. Your website recommends against routine screening mammography in women aged 40 to 49. Do you think that this statement would be perceived by younger women younger than 50 that they should not get a mammogram on your website? We have communicated very poorly about the C recommendation. It is clear that many women, many physicians, and certainly the media interpreted that language as if we were recommending against women in their 40s ever having a mammogram. That was not our intention. I understand, but we are concerned of commissions. We are concerned of bureaucracy. We are concerned of rationed care. We are concerned about bureaucrats saying, there is no real net benefit. And then we go, yeah, it is right. It is exactly what we are concerned about. And that is why we are having this debate. In the bill, and Chairman Pallone, I think pretty adequately talked about the differences. We know that services with a rating or A and B must be included in an essential benefit package. In this case, with the highest rating of C, women would not receive. Currently, if this was law, as is today, women in the C 
category would not receive this as a covered benefit under this under 3962. And that is part of our concern. And this does segue into the full health care debate. The commissioner on part of the bill, and I don't have the whole 2,000 pages, I just pulled out excerpts. The commissioner shall specify the benefits to be made available under exchange participating health benefits plans during each year. And then you can go further on. Basic enhanced and premium, and then the premium plus A, approved by the commissioner. And then you can go to the C section, which was again highlighted. And we continue to have preventative services, including those services recommended with a grade A or B by the Task Force on Clinical Pre Preventative Services. So the, 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 this is, uh, again, for a lot of us, uh, an important bait. Do any of you know an individual who's been diagnosed for cancer between the ages of 40 and 49, personally? I know many individuals who've been diagnosed with and cancer Dr. from the Colon? ages in 40 and 49. Yes. And then the other question, what about over the age of 74? Anyone who's been yes. diagnosed with? Yes. Because although we're focusing on 40 to 49, in, in your report, seven, over 74 has the I category. And we, we don't even know if it is. So what are we saying to those over the age of 74? I speak to the, to the evidence and to the mapping of the evidence to the task force recommendations. And, and I appreciate that. And I only got 38 seconds, and I'm, I'm going to be punctual on my time. Part of this concern with H.R. 3962 is, as we said, the public option, the gateway to a one-payer system, eventually rationed care, and then a decision made based upon the financial ability of the country to fund care across the spectrum, but also our seniors in our country. And again, this incomplete aspect for 74 bespeaks to the concern that if you're elderly in this country and we get to a one-payer system, there will be decisions made not based upon health care, but on cost. And I yield back my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Waxman, Chairman Waxman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the health care bill that the Republicans are complaining about is not law, yet your agency, uh, Preventive Task Force, is in operation. Uh, this is set up under, is it set up under law? Yes. Okay, and your job isn't to make recommendations to insurance companies, is it? That is correct. Your job is to make recommendations on preventive services so that the latest science and information about the science is communicated to clinical practitioners. Isn't that your job? That is correct. And this is very useful information. Now, we are focused on the breast cancer issue, but that's not the only area where you've made recommendations. Isn't that true? That is correct. How many other areas have uh, the task force made recommendations in the last couple of years, let's say? Well, our current portfolio is 105 total, and we take up around 15 new or updated topics uh, annually. You've recommended that teenagers be screened for mental illness. Yes, that was a new recommendation this year, Congressman, that we just came out with this. So this is new services that had not been recommended prior. And, and there was a uh, breastfeeding behavioral intervention recommendation. That is correct. And you've had a recommendation that aspirin for the prevention of cardiovascular disease uh, be a way to prevent the disease. Is That's that right? Correct. So you've had a whole range. You say how many? 103? 105 total. 105 total. I, I'm assuming that none of the others have been as controversial as this particular one. That is correct. Okay, so we, we have a controversial issue because it, it, it challenges the accepted notion about the frequency of breast cancer screening, and we're going to hear a lot more about that from the next panel. But I want to have us look at the, the challenge that's being raised by some of the Republicans, which I think is all political. They're acting as if your recommendations based on bringing the scientists who have the expertise 
which are directed at clinical people, will be used to ration care. That's their, that's their argument. We're going to ration care. And they then say, well, that's because there's going to be a health care bill that will provide a requirement for minimum benefits. Now, there'll be minimum benefits in that you should have access to hospitals. You should have access to doctors. Uh, you should have access to, to pharmaceuticals. Uh, your area is in the preventive area. And nothing could be more important to me than having the latest science on how to prevent diseases. Because if we can prevent illnesses, we won't pay to treat them later. Uh, your task force will continue in operation. You'll convene the scientists who are experts in different areas of prevention. Now, how? I guess the question, I'm sp not raising this to you, but the question is, how will your recommendations affect the minimum benefits that will be required for health care uh, insurers? Health care insurers could be a public insurance if that survives in this legislative process. It certainly would be private insurance. Right now, private insurance doesn't have to abide by your recommendations. Isn't that true? That is correct. And some of them cover these preventive services and some of them don't. Isn't that true? That's correct. Isn't it's it? their decision. But if we're going to provide uh, subsidies for people to get insurance and we're going to try to get a market where insurance companies compete against each other based on price and quality, we ought to make sure that all of them provide at least a minimum set of benefits. Uh, uh, one of the star uh, 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 issues for Republicans is to have a lot of insurance plans that don't provide any minimum benefit at all. Uh, they, can, they can be cheaper if they don't provide minimum benefits. Well, uh, um, I, I, I find that troubling. But let's say we're going to have minimum benefits and you make a recommendation. Is your recommendation under the proposed bill automatically going to be in effect for all insurance? Do you know whether that to be the case? Uh, Congressman, I, I'm not well versed. You're not, a, you're not an expert on the bill, but let me, correct. let me explain what the new bill will do. The new bill will take your, your recommendations, they'll go to the secretary, the secretary will review them, the secretary will have a notice of rule and comment and a public process and then decide whether it's a minimum benefit. Now, a minimum benefit is a minimum benefit. It's not a maximum benefit. So if there's a recommendation, as you propose, on breast cancer screening, that will be not a requirement of insurance to do no more than that. It would be a recommendation that will, uh, be require, that will require insurance companies to do that as a floor, not a ceiling. I, I just wanted to set this out because I think some people watching this hearing may get confused when they hear stories about bureaucrats or uh, rationing care or the health care be, bill being a gateway to single payer. We expect a bill with competition and people to make choices between insurance plans, but we don't want the choices be, between insurance plans to be those who cover breast cancer screening and those who don't, but those with at least a minimum of preventive services that we could hope will prevent uh, diseases and the need for paying for care for those diseases. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Waxman. Next is uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you a question. I've got the uh, clinical guidelines, and I guess this is a reprint from the Annals of Internal Medicine, the last page of which is uh, an appendix which lists the members of the U.S. Preventative Task Services. Um, and the, a number of individuals are listed there. Uh, their specialties are not. Is, uh, is anyone on the list there a board-certified OB-GYN? Yes. There are uh, two board-certified OB-GYNs on the um, uh, task force, and that is a, a usual. We usually have at least we usually have two. Okay, which 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 are those two that are on the list that I have in front of me? Kimberly Gregory and Wanda Nicholson. Okay, and they and they both participated in this uh, in this decision. Kimberly Gregory was on the task force when this decision was voted. Wanda was not. 
There was another OBGYN on the task force when this topic was voted. That was George Sawaya, who is a professor of OBGYN at uh, University of California, San Francisco. Were these unanimous votes? That were no, the votes were not unanimous. Do we know how the individuals voted? Um, the, I can't recall that is um, in the record, and we could uh, make that um, in information available to the committee if that's important. I, I would like to see it. I don't know if the committee will deem it as important, but, but I would certainly appreciate the opportunity to see it. Now, was there, uh, is there a radiologist in this group? No. No, there's no radiologist in this group. Um, is that a problem? The expertise of this panel has been called in question. Um, the experts are individuals who have experience in screening science and prevention. Radiologists were consulted and reviewed the documents and the recommendations and provided um, input. Well, let's wait till that finishes. It bothers me too. On the um, On this task force, then, uh, the majority of these individuals were primary care doctors. Was our general surgeon on the board or on the task force? Well, the, they're, um, again, the experts are experts in primary care and prevention. And yes, there were, and I would have to count them, four primary care physicians on the task force currently and four at the time that these were voted. But was there a general surgeon who specializes in uh, no, there was no needle localization and breast biopsy? No, there wasn't. Okay. They were um, consulted. They were consulted. All right. What, uh, and I apologize for being in and out, but we're doing like nine simultaneous hearings today, and the financial services makeover requires some attention and thought as well. On the, uh, on the issue, though, of, of talking about, you, you said you factored in the, the, the psychological events surrounding a, a callback on a positive mammogram, you've factored in the psychological cost, if you will, to the, to, to the patient in that exchange. Is that, do I understand that correctly? Well, the, the issue was a qualitative assessment. Um, anxiety, psychological distress, inconvenience are all considered to be harms and potential harms. And again, it's a part of the net benefit equation. When, when I was in schools back in the 1970s, I realized it was a long time ago, but mammographic screening was not, at least in the area where I went to school, was, that was not something that was done. You, you sent someone for a mammogram, it was kind of a big deal because you felt something, or, um, but it wasn't done as, as just part of a routine screening. In fact, I don't think, as, as I recall looking back, it was probably the mid-80s when that became a, a standardized screening test, and in fact, in Texas, we, and I, I don't know whether this is true nationwide, but in Texas, I know women can self-refer for mammography. Um, when that all happened, that psychological cost was one of the arguments that was used by people who felt that routine screening would not be a good idea. So how is it that we've come to the point now where we rejected it back in the 1980s, but now in 2009, this is a factor again that's, that's worthy of our consideration? It, 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 again, the, this is not determinative. It's information that we want women to know about. We want to know them to know how common it is. Uh, again, the um, pulse positive rate is much lower as women get older, and that's part of the net risk benefit equation. We would not want women to be afraid of having a mammography. This is, again, one piece of information that women and their physicians should discuss when deciding when to start screening. On, and does that same rationale apply to uh, uh, self-examination? The task force recommended against clinicians teaching women breast self-examination. They did not recommend that women not pay attention to their bodies, that they ignore lumps, or that they ignore problems that might come up when they find a lump. Again, the, the task force recommendation was against doctors teaching women breast self-examination. Well, how are women supposed to get that knowledge? They can't just 
get it by intuition, the, someone somewhere along the line has got to provide them some, some, some guidelines on the proper time to, to do the exam and, and, and how to do it and, and what to be concerned about and, and what not to be concerned about. That, as I recall, I don't, I, now I may be wrong on this, but I don't ever recall coding and being compensated for teaching clinic, uh, teaching breast self exam. So it's not a, I mean, I wasn't a cost center for you. I wasn't a cost driver. Um, my only inference from that could be that you're worried that people will find things that then lead to procedures and we're better off if we don't ask, don't tell. Again, the, the evidence, there have been two very well conducted randomized clinical trials in which women were taught how to do breast self-examination and both of those trials found no overall benefit in terms of reducing mortality from breast cancer. Again, we, we go to the evidence. Well, Gentlemen's and I, I will say anecdotally, as, as I said in my opening Mr. statement, Burgess, that it does. Mr. Burgess, you're, you're over two that, minutes over your time. It does strike me that the uh, Mr. best Burgess. amount of disease was brought to my attention by the patient herself. And again, as a young Dr. Burgess, age, I time has expired. <laughs> I'll just be interested in what some of the other clinicians tell us when they get their chance to testify. Thank you, Chairman. Dr. Burgess, you're almost three minutes over, and we're, we're about to vote. Um, I think we have time for one more uh, set of questions, and then we're going to vote. We have five votes. Um, we'll take one more set of questions, and then we'll adjourn and come back after the five votes. Uh, next is uh, Chairman Dingell. Did you want to proceed now? I, I think I could proceed rather quickly, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Um, I'd like to welcome you both to the committee and tell you how helpful it is to have you here. Uh, from the things I've heard said on the other side of the aisle about you folks at the, at, at the agency, I was afraid you'd appear with horns, tail, fangs, and in a red suit, breathing fire, uh, demanding that we immediately terminate all health benefits for the unfortunate, sick, weak, poor, and especially with regard to mammograms and pap smears. So I'm very much comforted. I want to welcome you to the committee this morning. Um, I just have really one question that I think is important. I find it curious that the task force has repeatedly, over the years, voted to leave costs out of its deliberations on whether to provide or not a proved preventive service. Why? why? Thank you, <clears throat> Congressman. I think this is a key question. The task force believes its major charge um, from Congress and responsibility to primary care clinicians and patients is that we set the evidence-based stake in the ground immune from how much it costs to achieve the benefits associated with a given effective preventive service. So, so your short answer is that you are recommending the needed services the needed tests, the needed treatments, as opposed to looking at the cost. Is that it? That is correct. Okay. Now, to assist my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and I do this out of great affection and respect and charity, you address this question on, in your statement, and you say here, and I read this for the benefit of my colleagues on the other side, you say, task force recommendations are based on consideration of the health benefits and health harms of providing the preventive service and on the scientific certainty of whether the preventive service works. Cost and ef cost effectiveness of specific prevention services are not addressed by the task force in its deliberation. Then you say this, the task force only, and that's underlined, considers scientific evidence of health benefits and health harms. The task force has specifically discussed whether costs should influence a recommendation and has repeatedly voted to leave costs out of deliberations on whether or not to provide a preventive service. Is that right? That is correct. Now, when your recommendations are made, are they used to put a ceiling on benefits or are they used to describe a minimum level of benefits that people should get? Congressman, I must admit that uh, it's outside the scope of our recommendations 
how they're used by other entities. Okay. Now, your recommendations are not expected to be substituted for the concerns and expertise of the doctor, and they're not intended to intrude into the doctor-patient relationship. Am I correct in that interpretation, or am I wrong? That is correct. In fact, if you read our statement as published in the annals, it says, the task force recognizes that, cl that clinical or policy decisions involve more considerations than this body of evidence alone. Clinicians should understand the evidence and individualize decision making to the specific patient or situation. This actually precedes all recommendations. It is a recommendation statement and we expect clinicians to do what they're trained to do in, in order to uh, address the needs of the individual patient for his or her best interest. Now you do uh, permit, as the task force goes about its business, to have different agencies and persons of concern present in the deliberations. Is that not so? That is correct. And your deliberations are public? At this point, the deliberations of a task force vote are by invitation only. But it by is. invitation. But they're, they've, you don't gag the people who come in to listen. They, they can go out and say what's going on. And they also are permitted to make comments to you on the task force. Is that not so? We actually invite comments from our partners to help us do our job better and to take into consideration different viewpoints and, and different issues. And you allow citizen input? The, the task force is, is currently moving towards increased private citizen input uh, with the resources we have available to consider and uh, identify those. We have, um, prior to this time, done more with input through uh, specific groups that we invite to comment because we think they're important stakeholders. This is an issue that the task force believes that in the interest of enhanced trans, uh, transparency and uh, responsibility to the American public and the patients, uh, whose physicians may consider our recommendation needs to be improved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Dingell. Uh, we have five votes, I would say about an hour, but when they're done, we'll come back and reconvene. Committee stands in recess. <coughs>
recommendations are made by the task force with the input of a variety of other specialty groups. They're not made in a vacuum. In this case, they were submitted to, I, I can't remember the number of partner organizations, but it was at least 10. Each of these partner organizations sent them out to experts. Those experts returned, um, provided written opinion. And, and, and some of those experts then would be cancer specialists. Yes. A uh, female yes. cancer specialist. There was a. So, so I think by that response, I guess you would take exception uh, to to the to the comments by uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Visco, but we'll hear from her later. Let me ask you uh, another question. On your website, <clears throat> and either you or Dr. Colon, uh, on the uh, USPSTF website, uh, it clearly states that the United States Preventative Service Task Force recommends against routine screening mammography in women aged 40 to 49 years. Do you think that this statement could be perceived by women younger than 50 that they should not get a mammogram? We need to immediately figure out how to get that statement off the website. I think it could be misconstrued. It has been misconstrued, and we need to fix our website. Dr. Petiti, I thank you for that response, and I, I hope that you will do that. I think it's very important. I agree with you. I want to ask you, Dr. Colon, uh, are you aware that the Senate version uh, of health care reform, specifically Section 4004, I think is on page 1150, it requires the Secretary of HHS to create a national prevention awareness campaign based on all of your task force recommendations both those that you favor, the A's and B's, and that those you recommend against, the, the C's and D's. Do you think that this national awareness campaign could be, could be perceived by women younger than 50 that they should not get a mammogram or perform a breast self-examination? I wonder if, you, uh, Congressman, if it would be okay if you restate your question because the first part of it and the second part I didn't. Well, it's, it, what I'm saying is in the Senate bill, if it becomes law, uh, if that prevails, the Senate language in the conference report, it becomes law. And it specifically says, and I named the page and section, <clears throat> that the secretary would require uh, the creation of a national prevention awareness campaign television uh, ads, TV spots, uh, based on all of the task force recommendations, both those that you're in favor of and those you recommend against. Don't you think or do you think this national awareness campaign could be perceived by women younger than 50 that they should not get a mammogram, nor should they perform self-breast examination? Thank you for the clarification, Congressman. Sure. So I, I can't speak specifically to the bill or to the policy. I will speak to the communication of the recommendation, which we believe needs to focus on the decision to start regular biennial screening before the age of 50 should be an individual one and take patient context into account, including the patient's values regarding specific benefits and harms. And so that message, which I realize is preceded by the uh, recommends against statement, is one we feel communication needs to be improved and the clear message of what the task force intended needs to lead that, not follow. Well, uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you'll bear with me just for maybe 15 seconds, I had one other point I wanted to make. <clears throat> the United States Preventive Service Task Force concludes that the current evidence is insufficient to assess the additional benefits and harms of clinical breast examination beyond screening mammography in women 40 years or older. That is saying that you don't recommend that the clinician, a physician, primary care physician, OBGYN specialist should routinely do a breast examination as part of a complete physical uh, in his or her patients? That that has no value? The evidence does not provide support for a clinician doing a clinical breast examination. Well, I thank you for that response and, I th and your honesty, Mr. Chairman. I know I've gone beyond my time. I appreciate your patience. I think that's terrible, and something needs to be done about that. Uh, next is um, our vice chair, the gentlewoman from uh, California, Ms. Capps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I just want to say thank you to both of you uh, for being here, for your excellent testimony and for being among the few on Capitol Hill who 
uh, apologize occasionally, uh, and uh, it's not a, a habit that we do very well. So the fact that you, I wouldn't call it an apology as much as, as acknowledging the, the communication glitches that occurred perhaps. And for me, um, I, I think it was a lot of it being timing. Um, but I don't take it as a negative thing. I think we are seeing as a very positive overall experience uh, uh, happening in our country, not to minimize the confusion that many women um, experience, but I think we can use it as a teachable moment, let's put it that way. Um, the timing of the release of the report and the debate on health care reform has been seized by many who want to detract really from the health care legislation uh, to use uh, your testimony um, in, in uh, widely misconstrued ways. And I want to take a minute of my time <clears throat> to um, mention one very important distinction, but it's also a, a, an important point of what the health care reform bill is, which actually will be augmenting a lot of the preventive work that you're uh, doing because uh, women will be able to have a, a occasion to understand more about cancer prevention in its wider forms and their behaviors and their body changes, uh, which are all essential. But the essential benefits package in the exchange consists of 11 benefit categories, including uh, inpatient hospital services as examples, uh, outpatient services, maternity care, prescription drugs, as well as preventive services. But with regard to preventive services, the bill says that the recommended items and services with a grade of A or B from U.S. Preventive Services Task Force shall be covered as part of the essential benefits package. A rightful designation of the importance of your studies and your recommendations, but uh, um, not a conclusive uh, piece of it. And that, they that this be something which we highly recommend, that there be no cost sharing for this uh, grade A and B of the, your recommendations. The uh, Benefits Advisory Committee, part of the health reform, will be able to recommend through its public standard setting process that additional preventive services such as mammograms for women under uh, 40 or between 40 and 49 be covered without cost sharing. I mean, there's an additional recommendation that can come as part of the health care bill. The Secretary may also approve such coverage. Um, the essential thing here is that the benefits package, essential benefits package, is a floor, not a ceiling. And that really is important for, I want the record to state that very clearly. An employer, once the exchange goes into effect and there's real competition between private insurance plans, um, they, they may wish to offer more a, a pa attractive packages to, to win more, uh, uh, you know, coverages so that it might be well be uh, understood more fully as we go along this debate. I just wanted to make sure that that be in the record. But I wanted to give you even uh, more opportunity, both of you or one of you, to talk about what could the future could hold. You see, I think this is an opportunity, a, a, wow, a wow moment, as one of the uh, advocate groups put it. And I want to commend all of the breast cancer advocacy groups who have brought us to a level in this country where when a recommendation, set of recommendations like yours comes out, um, that there is a more intelligent uh, audience receiving it, able to understand it and able to use it and to advocate even more in a wide range of ways, which I think is very healthy for our country to be a, a, a part of. I want you to, I'm only giving you about a minute, but I, I'd like you to elaborate further on ways that your, advice, your task force can um, communicate in the future in ways that maybe we can uh, access and use more efficiently. Well, um, what I thought would happen with these recommendations is that it would move the discussion more towards the notion of individualized decision making and risk stratification. What I thought is it might in initiate a dialogue where we decided to work harder at, at finding out who really is at higher risk so we could make more tailored recommendations for screening. And among those groups that we really have ignored are African American women who are Absolutely. younger and women of Ashkenazi Jewish background, some of whom have a very high risk based strictly on their um, membership in this group. Again, what I thought would happen would be a move towards individualized, tailored, risk stratified decision making and not this sort of a uh, rehashing of a bunch of old data. Mr. Dr. Collage, would you like to add anything to that? And I know I'm s squeezing a little few more seconds. 
I think this is really important. I want to echo the issue about individualized decision making. I think we, we hear a lot about personalized medicine and I think the basis of personalized medicine can be and should be individual based decision making. And it's really what we were hoping the language for the younger age group would start engendering this issue about, you know, we, we as consumers of health care um, sh should kind of understand yep. that every test we have and every treatment we have has both inherent risks and benefits. And we should make our decisions based on understanding those and then what's important to us. And that underscores the value of the work that you do in this topic and in every other topic and the importance of having educated health in the areas of health, a population that can uh, seize the, the material as, as well as primary care providers and other doctors as well, you know, who use your information every single day to make the kind of informed decisions that they and, and their patients need, need to have before them. So I hope this can be the beginning. I, I again, want to thank our chairman. This is the kind of setting, this hearing setting, that is so important for us to take advantage of and use your expertise and your research and have this kind of debate, if you will, but discussion. Uh, so I thank you again for, your, for being here. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Uh, thank you for, for being here. And I have some quick yes or no questions, if I may, just to, to get through it. Uh, were you familiar with the, the, the references to your task force in the bill as it was introduced in July? No. No. So in, it, you knew nothing about the over a dozen references to your, your task force in this bill? Um, you know, I, I hate to say, but I was busy preparing a course in biostatistics, and the answer is Honestly, no. Okay, and is that consistent through the whole task force or any of its representatives or administration uh, uh, thereof? I hesitate uh, to have the two of us represent uh, the opinions of all the rest of the task force. But it wasn't part of your discussions? It was not? In okay. July? Absolutely yeah. not. Okay. Um, are you aware that in, the, in this particular bill, and I think maybe the chairman is, our ch health care committee chairman was mistaken, and I think the uh, chairman emeritus was mistaken. This is not necessarily a new committee, they may create a new name, uh, but in the bill, and I'll just read right from the bill, uh, uh, the Preventative Services Task Force convened under Section 915A of the Public Health Service Act and the Task Force on Community Preventive Services, and then in quotation marks, as such section and task forces were in existence the day before the date of the enactment of this act, shall be transferred to the Task Force on Clinical Preventive Services and the Task Force on Community Preventive Services, respectfully, established under these sections. And then it goes on to say that whatever your recommendations were prior to that enactment are in effect. Are you aware of that, sir? Or ma'am? Well, yes certainly. No? Uh, Ye yes no. or no, I'm yes, sorry. Yes, yes. I'm now aware of it. But uh, were you aware of that during your deliberations? No. Okay. Would that have changed your deliberations at all? I can't speculate because on what might have happened. Uh, interesting. So what you're saying is that according to the law of which this committee wants to enact, you have now taken ages 40 to 49 and made them a category C, which means they will not be paid for under this committee. That's interesting. And let me ask you this. You say you didn't consider costs. Is every appendix that is attached to your, your uh, task force recommendation, is that something that would have been reviewed by the individuals who made the determination? Is that something of value? That's why you attached it as an appendix, I imagine? Yes, all the material and evidence is germane Perfect. to the decision. Thank you very much. Are you familiar with Appendix C1, where the question is, what is the cost effectiveness of screening that assigns a dollar value by quality of years of life? Are you familiar with this? This clearly is a cost effectiveness por portion of your study. Clearly, you cannot in good conscience tell this committee you didn't consider cost. You just told me that every piece of information according to your study is considered. This is a dollar value per quality of life, and it's done on mammography screenings. The I, I would, I mean, will you remove this from your task force study as well? As your I, recommendation that said that I'm, you... I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm trying to see what you're pointing at, and I... Uh, it's feel... Appendix C1 of your own task force recommendation that clearly, clearly considers costs just by your own testimony. And, and again, it's, you can see why women of America and those of us who are very concerned about bureaucracies interacting 
between healthcare on your website, again, you say that you recommend against routine screening. You say that you're going to take that off. That's great. You say that, gee, we didn't consider costs, but on your own report, it says you considered costs. You can see why, after we're creating 118 new, brand new commissions just like yours, all of your authority will now be enacted into law, according to their own bill, by the reference I've just read. I, I mean, it's pretty serious. And let me ask you another question. Uh, as a part of this, uh, it says, and I'm going to read this again from the bill, because I think some of my members uh, on the other side maybe I either haven't read the bill or maybe misunderstand their own language. But uh, even under the, this is the Indian uh, health care section, section 206, I would encourage you to read it under mam mammography and other cancer screening, uh, the secretary shall ensure that screening provided for under this paragraph complies, meaning you've got to do it, with the recommendations of the task force with respect to A, frequency, B, the population to be served, and C, the procedure or technology to be used, all of which is referenced in your report. Imagine that when this passes, your report now becomes a matter of law, according to their own language in this bill right here. Is that, would that change your consideration as a scientist, knowing, as by your own testimony, it did not pass unanimously? You say science and evidence, but clearly people of, uh, who are equally as learned as both of you believe that that was the wrong answer? I mean, is this something you should reconsider? Mr. Rogers, look. No, no, I would like an answer to No, I know, but I'm going to ask you to go beyond that. I mean, you, you used your five minutes. You take what time is necessary to respond because I'm not sure you even know what the questions are, but please well, I, take I was, the time. I was going to well, say I got my that yes and no's. There, there were a number of different questions and I'm not sure which one to respond to. What I would like to say, and I want to say it again on the record, that when we voted the recommendations for mammography screening A, B, and C, we voted them without regard to cost or cost effectiveness analysis. I can say that the word honestly, absolutely, the word cost was not in the room, it was not mentioned, it was not uttered, and it did not in any way determine But it was part of your study. Was it not? Was it not part of your study? You just told me that everything that was in your study was considered, Appendix C1 considered cost. How could you? All right, look, look Mr. Rogers' time is up. You, you can right. respond and I, say I, what I, you want, but we've got to move on. Mr. Chairman, if you'd like. I, I have nothing more to say. Yeah. Mr. Rogers, I'm just trying to make sure she has, uh, is able to respond, but I think we should move on because we're a minute over now and I think she's, she doesn't want to say anything else. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, well, my only caution here is that I, and I, I, I understand I do, I do what believe you're the saying. No, I do believe the intention of the other side is real. I do believe that. But the language of the bill, of which I believe that most members of Congress have not read. But she has, has repeatedly said that the bill, she didn't even know what was in the bill. And their deliberations were done under the previous administration before President Obama was even President of the United States. But so Mr. Chairman, the point here is that she did say that the cost wasn't as part of their voting, but it certainly was part of their report. That's very important knowledge for well, all of us I'm to just, know when we raise I questions can, about adding, when you change you, you made your statement. She responded to it. Let's move on. But I, I just, I, I can't help but repeat that their deliberations, as they said, even preceded the current administration. But whatever, let's move on. Um, next uh, on the Democratic side is um, the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Your mic not working there? On now, right? Thank you. Um, thank you for your uh, presentations and, and your answers thus far. But I want to go back to the issue of African American women. Some years ago, many of us worked to ensure that mammograms would be recommended and covered for women of African descent under age 40. And um, given that even though we may have a lower breast cancer incidence, we're more than likely to be diagnosed at later stages and have a higher uh, mortality rate. And even in younger women, um, we find that younger African-American women are more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer. So in the recommendations, why wouldn't 
the task force single out this particular group and maybe give them a different recommendation other, rather than lumping all women between 40 and 49 or younger under C or I? You make an excellent point. And I think, again, what I expected to happen with these recommendations is that we would begin to focus on how to make more stratified and nuanced recommendations that would identify those groups who are unrecognized as being at higher risk of consequences of breast cancer when diagnosed at a young age. So even though the bill says in the Indian Health Service that the, um, your recommendations would be applied, you might look at the Native American population as a group and decide maybe a different grade for different age groups in that particular age group and make that recommendation. Might that, that, might that not happen? Yeah, that, I think that the accompanying editorial to our recommendations pointed the direction that we thought we would be going after okay. these, you know, not in Congress trying to um, defend them, but moving to the point where we have more individualized risk. And I would, I would say that based on my understanding of the science, which I follow very closely, that breast cancer in young African American women is a topic which is not widely appreciated as being one which perhaps needs a different kind of recommendation. Um, again, we need to do better at the risk stratification and individualized risk. I, I can't say the, the task force is going to immediately be able to go back and I understand, do something. but you recognize it, and, and, and this is not the final answer. This is definitely not the final answer. I think people would have wished that we would have not even ever opened this topic again after 2002. <laughs> Especially um, not right now. Well, <laughs> that was an accident. <laughs> but um, given what occurred um, in response to the article and the press taking it up and how it has been interpreted, would you have you looked at other ways of presenting um, recommendations that might be controversial. I've never really oh. liked the fact that the press really gets these advance notices and they start to tell us what is coming up in the next medical journal because they don't really understand it. Well, w w we communicated um, very poorly. Um, we should have spent more time talking with our stakeholder groups. We should have had a formal communication plan both to right. consumers and physicians. I agree. Um, can you explain how that the overdiagnosis is a bit confusing? Can you explain how overdiagnosis occurs when DCIS or early stage lesions, especially in younger, a younger individual, is diagnosed and treated? Because my understanding on the DCIS is that it's likely a precursor to invasive cancer. So, is the task force saying that it might be better to not diagnose it, or if you think it's there, to leave it alone and not? Um, do further investigation or remove it? Uh, because I would think an anxiety is one of the issues that you raise. I would think it would be more anxiety provoking to think that I had a CA in situ or, or um, a early, non, a early um, stage cancer and sit and wait on it rather than to have it biopsied and removed. Well, here we're definitely getting way out of my range of expertise. Um, this is a topic which uh, I would want to have addressed by a, a medical oncologist uh, and those who are now working so hard to try to understand better um, how we separate and differentiate those tumors that are going to progress rapidly and those tumors that aren't going to progress. It. But this is, this is outside my area of expertise. Well, speaking to a medical oncologist, a uh, uh, surgical oncologist actually yesterday, they feel that DCIS is many times a precursor to invasive cancer, and I'm surprised that it's listed as one of those things that maybe we're over-diagnosing or over-treating. But I think my time is up, so thank you for your answers. Gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shadding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I have to express some sympathy for you. You stepped into a controversy which has been made much larger as a result of the overall health care reform that's going forward, and I, I think that to a certain degree, uh, you have been sucked into a much larger battle than your own efforts to try to make recommendations would have otherwise merited. As I understand your recommendation, you base it on science and you say, look, 
here's what we have concluded based on that science. It shouldn't be automatic. It ought to be something you think through, and here's our recommendations. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. I presume from that that you believe that it should be a decision between the patient and her doctor, and that, for example, uh, if a patient, particular patient had uh, a history of cancer or breast cancer, then you might get screening uh, at a younger age uh, or in some of the categories where you didn't feel it should be automatic, uh, but under those circumstances it should occur. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, you would then agree with me that if the government were to prohibit an insurance plan from providing coverage for someone who, after consulting with her doctor or looking at her family history, thought she needed it, that would make that at least not an insurable event, correct? I am not here to get involved in the coverage and the right. health care reform coverage issue. Fair enough. Uh, I, I will just then state for the record that in my view, uh, the government should never prohibit someone and the government should never be able to prohibit someone from offering mammogram coverage or as an insurance company uh, or a public plan, nor should it be able to prohibit an individual woman uh, or her family from deciding they want to purchase mammogram coverage. Uh, and I am deeply troubled uh, that this bill, which seems to be the larger context into which your uh, work has been uh, uh, reported, uh, does precisely that. I do want to say that it is important, Mr. Chairman, that facts be abided by. And unfortunately, in a piece of legislation this size, it's subject to interpretation and it's subject to uh, quick review without people being very precise in their language. I want to make it very clear. I mean no personal offense by this, but there have been things stated in this room today that are flat untrue. For example, uh, the chairman said that if a C option, you have your A and your B and now a C, uh, uh, is determined by the secretary to be covered, it is to be covered. That is in fact flat not true. In only, the only way a C option can be covered under the language of this bill is for two things to happen. First, the Health Care Benefits Advisory Committee has to say, contrary to what the bill says, we think it should be covered and then the secretary has to say it. So it's not a single decision by the secretary. Second, and I'm sorry he's not here, but the chairman of the full committee came and made an adamant argument, which has been repeated several times here today, that the bill prescribes minimum, minimum benefits, and therefore to say that coverage of mammograms is not prohibited is untrue, that all the bill does is prescribe minimums. That it also is flat not true. If you go to page 169 of the bill passed by the Congress, you will discover, as I mentioned earlier, that there are four levels of plans. There is a basic plan, an enhanced plan, a premium plan, and a premium plus plan. The basic plan can only cover A's and B's, the things you recommend be an A or a B. It could cover a C if the two exceptions I just pointed out were to occur. But the basic plan, absent those two things happening, does not cover anything but A's and B's. But more important than that, the definition of enhanced plan and the definition of premium plan both prohibit any additional benefits. They say you can have an enhanced plan and you can have lower cost sharing. You can have a premium plan and it can have lower cost sharing. But it can only cover the basic services. So all three of the first levels of plans are prohibited from covering any service other than an A or a B. Only until you get the definition of a premium plus plan, and I would point the chairman of the full committee to page 169, lines 20 through 25, does it say a premium plus plan is a premium plan that also provides additional benefits. That's the only plan that can provide a benefit beyond the basic plan. And therefore, the first three levels of plans are prohibited from covering mammograms uh, by law, whether they're offered by the government or offered by a private insurance company, whether they're in the public plan or in a private plan, they are prohibited. And that may not be the intent. As the ranking member, Mr. Barton, made very clear, we need to deal not with what the, in, what the, we need to deal with what the bill says, and if it does not reflect our intent, and I would hope in this case it doesn't, because I don't think the government ought to be in the business of telling people 
you cannot buy coverage for mammograms, then we need to fix the language of the bill, or at least talk truthfully about it. And the chairman of the full committee was wrong uh, when he said that this sets only minimums. There are words at the beginning of the bill which refer to minimums, but the words of the bill specifically say it can only cover those items with the exception of when both the secretary and the Health Benefits Advisory Committee decide to cover a C. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to put that into the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Look, I just I don't want to keep belaboring the point, but the reason I responded to your statement and said that there were situations where the secretary, and now you're saying the advisory commission could add it to a basic benefit package, was because when you made your opening statement, you suggested that they that it couldn't be done that way, that they couldn't include it. So I mean, I, I don't want to belabor the point. I don't disagree with you, but you're disagreeing with yourself because you initially said that they couldn't add it as a basic benefit. Now you're saying they can. You uh, if the gentleman would yield, sure. Uh, I actually didn't say they couldn't add it. I didn't discuss whether they could add it. I said that well. the basic plan cannot offer it, and it cannot offer it absent extraordinary circumstances, which are two other things. Well, I think we're saying. I see. I think. And, 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 and I think what we're. I think the problem is we're saying the same thing, but I'm not going to get into it. I I don't think there's any difference between what you said and what I said. Right, let's, let's agree on that. But let's agree to fix it so that the bill doesn't say well. that someone cannot choose to buy a plan. For that matter. Let's allow people who get a public plan uh, I, I'm not to get gonna, mammogram coverage. I'm not going to continue to belabor it because I think that we're not necessarily disagreeing on whether it could or could not be included. Um, let's. Um, the next person is uh, the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, very much for your testimony today. My, uh, I believe the larger issue is the lack of access to any screening or health service for millions of American women uh, of all ages. And I'd like you to comment um, upon the implica implications of your latest recommendations uh, on the millions of women who are not being screened at all. What do you, what do you say to them, no matter their age? You know, again, the task force can't fix these problems. I'm here as a member of the task force speaking to mammography guidelines and speaking to the evidence we use to make them. There are clearly huge issues facing this country about health care and health insurance and health policy, but I'm not an expert in that area. If, if I could just add to the point that it's clear that the provision of mammography and screening for breast cancer extends life. And so that's the service that we've, we recommend. Um, and, and I think uh, everyone in the room knows that and needs to keep in mind that, that if the idea is to maximize health and extend life, then the services that are recommended should be considered for provision. I mean, your, your recommendations talk about how um, for example, the age 40 to 49, how it is important for women and their doctors to have these, um, to have a personalized plan with their trusted physician, but there are, there are many, many women out there who don't have a trusted physician. They don't have, um, they're, not, they're not receiving their checkups. Um, certainly you all have something to say to women all across America, no matter their age, uh, on being as proactive as they can, uh, taking personal responsibility, finding that you, you must have something to say on, on higher risk groups uh, to help us communicate in a better way. You've, you've already acknowledged that there, you did not do a good job in, in communication, but here's your, your chance today to, to bring all of your expertise and to, to provide a a message to women on the importance of, of uh, taking personal responsibility and getting their screens. They may not have access to care, but, but there are uh, wonderful nonprofit groups where uh, they provide some services in communities. Can you, can you at least go, go that far and provide a, a proactive message to women in, in this country on, on the importance of uh, 
taking care of themselves and seeking out these screenings? Well, again, I, I feel uncomfortable in being asked to put on a personal, uh, a personal hat rather than my task force hat. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't um, encourage women to be interested in their health, to take care of themselves. But I'm here as a member of the task force to speak to the mammography guideline recommendations and not to go beyond my, my expertise. Um, I have friends who have no insurance. My daughter is uninsured. I know women who are uninsured and can't, can't get surgeries they need. But that is not my role here. My role here is to speak to the mammography guidelines. The, um, you're familiar with the, the huge disparities in screening, diagnosis, and treatment among um, various income levels. And, and if you're African American, you're Latina, uh, correct? You have? We, there are disparities in health care throughout all services. The, um, if you could go back, or, or will you go back and review your recommendations uh, along the lines of higher risk groups, what we know of uh, disparities of screening, uh, diagnosis, and treatment, don't you think you could have done a, a better job in, in fleshing out some of that, some of those recommendations? I, I think on many levels we know we could do a better job, and among them is the communication. We need to, uh, we have tried for a number of years to make our recommendations more risk stratified. Uh, for breast cancer, this has been perhaps a little more difficult than for some other topics like osteoporosis. But again, what I thought would happen with these recommendations is we would start having exactly this kind of discussion. How do we find women who are at extremely high risk, how do we communicate with them effectively, how do we make uh, screening mammography something that is more individualized and tailored? Thank you. I would only <clears throat> add to that a plea for consideration of research of preventive services in the specifically specific populations who are underrepresented in screening and other prevention studies. We often fail in this area, and, and I will inform the committee that we have a discussion about health disparities associated with nearly every recommendation vote. And the frustration on our point is the lack of evidence of efficacy in a specific trial aimed at high-risk populations. <clears throat> um, so I think this is uh, a consideration of the task force, and as we are evidence-based, th this is a real plea on our part for researchers and funders of research to consider adequate studies that include disparate groups for where we are concerned there may be differences and require different recommendations. Thank you. The gentlewoman um, complete? All right, <laughs> thanks. Uh, the gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess you're not uh, used to women speaking a little more quickly and being a bit more succinct. So maybe that's why we have time left <laughs> many times. Um, I, I want to thank you all for your patience and your endurance. Um, today, and I really want to thank you for being here. This is an issue that is of tremendous concern to us. And as we look at what your findings were, and as we look at the language of the bills that are before us, I think what we want to make certain we do is if there is offending language in the bill, we want to get it out. And of course, we want to make certain that we have a clear understanding of what you brought forward and of your intent. And I'm going to try to be succinct on this because I do know you're, you're ready to move on and we have another panel. Uh, Dr. Burgess did ask that you submit the vote.
from your committee as you arrived at your finding and your guidance that you made public? And as you submit that vote, who voted and how? One thing I would like for you to do for the record is also submit to us your science or evidence upon which you based these recommendations. What was reviewed? What studies? What findings? What groups? If we can have that as a part of the record so that we can look at it, I think that would be very instructive to us as we decide how to best move forward. So I would like to ask you all to do that. Um, I'd also like to know what period of time, how long did you spend on this? How long was this up for discussion and under review? What was the, the thought process and the matrix that you worked from to come to this decision? Let us see a little bit about what you went through and how you went through it, how you work, what your process is, how you arrived at those decisions. I do honestly believe that will be helpful to us with an understanding. I, I will have to say I agree with some of my colleagues. You've probably stepped into a bit of a quagmire that you did not expect as you release these, uh, these findings. And I, I'd like to ask you, did, were you all aware of how the H.R. 3962, how it would affect you, how your task force would be drawn into that bill, that the uh, language of 3962 actually pulls you in, renames you, and then gives credence uh, to these findings through statute? Well, as unbelievable as it may seem um, to those who are so caught up in Washington, um, I was writing my biostatistics lectures and have been actually woefully and naively oblivious of what's been going on in the healthcare reform arena. Um, certainly from the point of view of specific statutory language in this now what I know is a 2,000 page bill, you know, I, I knew nothing. And uh, quite honestly, when I uh, found out that these recommendations were being released the week of the vote that was the big vote, I was sort of stunned and then also terrified. And I think my uh, being terrified was actually exactly the right reaction. Dr. Colon. I would like to add again, speaking specifically to the timeline for the consideration of this recommendation, that it was completed prior to uh, any sense that the role of the task force might change under upcoming health care reform. I will say that earlier this year we became aware of language in the House bill regarding the recommendations of the task force. Um, however, this recommendation uh, was considered and voted on with our explicit scientific methods well before that. Okay. I appreciate that. And I, I, I do thank you all for your sensitivity to this. I think the linkage that exists with the language of changing your title and then giving credence in the force of law, basically, to the priority assignments that you would make is of concern to us and to our uh, constituents. I thank you all. And I'm only going to yield back 18 seconds, but I yield it back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just so I understand this correctly, the task force uh, has been charged with de developing a scientifically determined floor for preventative services uh, in this bill. I mean, is that, is that your understanding of your role? You know, I'm, I'm realizing that I really don't understand the bill. I shouldn't speak to the bill. I've learned a lot okay. about the bill here. Well, the bill itself does, in fact, vest that kind of power within the task force, to develop a scientifically determined floor, in other words, a minimum threshold uh, under the uh, basic uh, uh, coverage. Those recommendations then follow uh, to the Benefits Advisory Committee. Your recommendations will establish a floor uh, under which the Benefits Advisory Committee cannot go. They can go higher, however. Once the Benefits Advisory Committee, and by the way, the Benefits Advisory Committee uh, consists of 
private medical doctors, patients, employers, insurance experts, a dentist, uh, and representatives of relevant government agencies. It is chaired by the Surgeon General. Once it issues its recommendations, the Secretary, those recommendations then are the floor. The Secretary then has the discretion to increase or enhance the coverage available in the basic essential benefits package. Once that has been established, private insurers have the additional option of, of offering more coverage. So the suggestion that because your task force has issued the recommendations that it has, uh, no insurance policies will cover mammograms for women in these categories, or even the, the suggestion that the essential benefits package as, as established by this bill will not cover them is preposterous. There is no truth in it. I do have a specific question I would like to ask you uh, regarding some confusion that your findings have uh, created back home in my district. Uh, there was a recent letter to the editor, editor very widely distributed uh, regarding your findings uh, that have created some confusion. I would ask that you try to clear this up for us. Uh, the author of this letter writes, What's mo this is a quote, what is most troubling about the Federal panel's recommendations is that they are based mainly on cost saving, end of quote. She also ex expresses concern that the recommendations are, quote, cost saving measures, end of quote. Uh, can you tell us today in no uncertain terms what the role of cost uh, of mammograms played in your investigation and findings? This is an easy question. Cost played no role in our recommendations. Again, and I have said it publicly in other settings and I will say it again here, I think I have said it three times here, cost was not a consideration in the voting of our recommendations. Thank you. And, and finally, uh, the author of that same letter pointed out that the task force contains, quote, no cancer specialists, end quote. Uh, this is obviously a, a point that would be disconcerting to many. Uh, is it true uh, that no members of the preventative task force have any experience in working with cancer? That, that is incorrect. Um, members of the task force consist of myself. I was the vice chair of the National Cancer Policy Board. One member is a member of the National Cancer Institute Board of Scientific Counselors. Another member, current member, is a uh, professor of, um, let's see, he's the director Associate Director of Population Sciences for the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Comprehensive Cancer Center and an endowed, endowed Chair of Oncology. Um, again, the members of the task force have the expertise in, that uh, permits them to make the kinds of recommendations they made within the arena of screening and preventive services. Thank you, Doctor. I yield back my time. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I know we I'll be as quick as we can. Uh, one, I want to welcome our doctors, and uh, um, I guess having served on this subcommittee for 12 years now, and the release from the USPTF probably got more coverage than anything our subcommittee's done, except the uh, uh, the health care bill, <laughs> and uh, and there was a lot of misinformation about it. But in your testimony, you say that individuals representing the views of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Academy of Family Physicians weighed in on your recommendations, and the obstetricians and gynecologists expressed concerns with the wording of the recommendations. Do you believe that in the future it would be a good idea for the task force to actually have individuals from these organizations, such as, those, such as uh, these as actual reviewers instead of commenters? Well, I, I, I want to clarify that they were official reviewers. First of all, as I pointed out, there were two members of the American College of Obstetrics, Obstetrics okay. and Gynecologists on the panel. They were official. Um, the a ACOG um, reviewers were official reviewers. Okay. Um, they made a number of comments. One of their comments, which was the most substantive comment in retrospect, was about our the the mis their anticipation of of misperception of our C recommendation, and they were right 
and we should have listened more carefully to them, and I'm sure we will listen more carefully in the future. Okay. And I think there was misinformation, I guess, on, on the self-exam, uh, the information, and from what your testimony earlier was that, you know, physicians need to be able to, uh, to provide the, the expertise on so women can do the self-exam. Uh, it's not perfect. If there's a question, then they ought to talk to their physician, and that's where it goes from there. It's, uh, so that's why I don't understand the fear of the, uh, the self-exam. But my last question is, a uh, major concern I have is the lack of transparency of the process within the USPSTF for deciding whether or not to change or create new screening recommendations. And depending on what happens with the health care bill, your initial uh, decision could make a big difference. How could the task force be more open to outside input and feedback? And what changes would you make in the future after what you've learned from this experience? Thank you for this uh, question. <clears throat> the task force understands the criticisms regarding transparency as our um, profile has been increased uh, during the discussion of health care reform. We believe it is incumbent upon us to increase our transparency in, in such a way that people understand, uh, as a previous congresswoman asked, how we get to the decisions that we get to. The task force is already working on new transparency approaches, including allowing internet-based uh, public comment on different work products. We think that's a good step. We're uh, cautiously trying to expand into areas of transport, uh, uh, transparency to include um, potentially uh, uh, public commentary during meetings and, and other approaches that we believe meet the intent and the requirement for transparency so that the decisions are made uh, in such a way that we're not spending time in front of the public trying to help people understand the processes. So w we understand this criticism. We actually started working on enhancing transparency about a year and a half ago. And, and uh, I, will, I will only tell the congressman that our slow working has to do with understanding the resource impact of becoming more transparent. But we absolutely believe we need to do it, and we're working towards that end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I think that uh, concludes our questions. But let me just thank both of you, really. I, I think that you did a, a tremendous job today of clearing up a lot of misunderstandings. And um, as someone who's been in politics, uh, I guess I could say my entire life, uh, I think it's kind of refreshing to find out that um, you know, you really were very independent and not at all aware of what we were doing. Um, I think we, we give ourselves too much importance. You know, we, we all think we're so important that everybody's paying so much attention <laughs> to everything we do. It's kind of refreshing to know that you were not. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll ask the next panel to come forward. Let me welcome our uh, second panel and introduce uh, the panel beginning on uh, my left is uh, Dr. Otis Webb Brawley, who is Chief Medical Officer for the American Cancer Society. And next is Jennifer Lur Lurie? Luray? Luray, who is President of the Susan G. Komen for the Cure Advocacy Alliance. And then we have Dr. Donna Sweet who is a member of the American College of Physicians Clinical Assessment Efficacy Subcommittee. And finally, Fran Visco, who is president of the National uh, Breast Cancer Coalition. I know some of you have been here before. <laughs> and uh, thank you for being here. Um, you know, I, I won't repeat that we have the, f we ask you each to keep your comments, if you can, to five minutes. They become part of the record. And uh, if you want to, you can submit additional written comments later. But let's start with Dr. Brawley. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. I'm Otis Brawley, the Chief Medical Officer of the American Cancer Society. 
On behalf of the 11 million patients and survivors in America today, the Society thanks you for your continued leadership in the fight against cancer and your commitment to enacting comprehensive health care reform legislation this year. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today about the important role mammograms play in combating breast cancer deaths. As a medical oncologist who actually treats breast cancer patients, I've treated hundreds of breast cancer patients in my career indeed. I have observed firsthand the heartbreak this disease has on women, on women and their families. Over the years, I've also witnessed the advances we've made in breast cancer early detection and treatment, advances that have led to fewer women suffering and ultimately dying from this dreaded disease. I can't help but note that in our current system, our society prohibits a large number of women, 30 to 40 percent of those who should be getting mammograms from actually getting mammograms. I also have to note that my own research, uh, published and cited before this committee before, has shown that uninsured women of the same stage have poor survival compared to insured women of the same stage. That is to say that even when early detected, Insurance is a prognostic factor in breast cancer. Mr. Chairman, as you know, the Society in recent weeks has publicly disagreed with the recommendation of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force with respect to mammography. Let me say right now that I have tremendous respect for the task force. As an academic physician, I look forward to virtually everything that the task force has published over the last 20 years uh, regarding cancer. I also want to say that reasonable experts can look at the science and disagree. There is useful screening that should be done and useless screening that actually can be harmful. And that is something that the task force, I think, should be looking at in an objective fashion and actually has generally done a very good job of doing. With respect to mammography, the scientific evidence supporting its value in reducing deaths from breast cancer is quite strong. In looking at the evidence, the society, along with other medical groups, believe that screening mammography offers an identifiable and important survival benefit to women in the age group 40 to 49 and indeed women age 40 and above. More specifically, the society believes that the reduction in mortality and less invasive treatments associated with early detection of breast cancer using mammography continues to warrant a recommendation of annual screening for all women beginning at the age of 40. We do agree with the task force that women should be informed of the potential risks as well as the potential benefits of the procedure. The data and literature examined by the task force in the lead up to its November announcement on mammography is essentially the same data reviewed by an expert panel of breast cancer researchers, clinicians, and epidemiologists convened by the American Cancer Society in 2003. However, in that earlier review, the Society's panel considered the additional findings of a population-based study of modern mammography, which showed much stronger benefits from screening compared with the more limited data examined by the task force. Translated, we actually think there's a greater benefit to mammography screening than does the task force. In addition, since that time, a number of advancements have emerged that have shown to increase the effectiveness of mammography for women aged 40 to 49. There have been improvements in the quality of mammograms resulting from the Mammography Quality Standards Act, or MQSA. There's been a shift to using digital mammograms over film mammograms, which research indicates may be more effective in screening younger women with denser breasts. The introduction of new technologies such as magnetic res resonance imaging uh, has also proven to be a particularly effective tool in high-risk women. Let me be very clear on the next point. We understand and acknowledge that mammography screening is not a perfect test. Indeed, it is an imperfect test. But we also believe that this imperfect test is the only good test other than awareness of one's breast to help save lives at this time. We can and we must invest in research to find better tools for detecting and treating breast cancer. Women deserve a better test than mammography. Indeed, one of the great problems right now is there's a certain complacency or satisfaction with the use of mammography in women of all ages. We need a better test. The essential fact right now is mammography is one of the two ways that we can use to save lives. 
I have to note that there's been a lot of talk about breast self-exam, and as a medical oncologist and epidemiologist who in, is involved in screening and reads the screening literature, uh, and the doctor who treats, let me say that we've been talking past ourselves when we talk about breast self-exam today. Breast self-exam, as shown in the medical literature and as spoken against by the task force, is a woman doing a specific regimen and exam once a month. It actually would take about 20 to 30 minutes for a woman to do. What most of us, including the American Cancer Society, have done is moved away from that regimented breast self-exam, which was advocated 20 to 30 years ago, toward something which is a little bit different, which is women being aware of their breasts and essentially being aware of their breasts and looking for differences in their breasts on an almost daily basis. This is called breast awareness. Most women indeed find their breast cancer through breast awareness, not breast self-exam. There are two randomized clinical trials that show that breast awareness and breast self-exam are equivalent in terms of mortality reduction, but breast self-exam actually increases the number of unnecessary biopsies done versus breast awareness. So I prefer to advocate breast awareness. I will note also, sir, that uh, approximately 30 to 40 percent of American women age 40 and up are currently not getting regular mammograms. In the United States, about half of all women diagnosed with breast cancer actually are diagnosed through this breast awareness and not through mammography. Uh, for many of the women who cannot get mammography, this is the only way that they can actually uh, have any type of early detection. In summing up, we know we can do better, and with your help, Mr. Chairman, we're heading in the right direction. The Affordable Health Care for America Act, recently passed by the House, will improve health care, and it provides a significant investment in cancer prevention and early detection by requiring first-dollar coverage for prevention in both public and private plans with little or no cost to patients. The Society and its affiliate, the American Cancer Society... Doctor, I, I think you're concluding, but I... I know you're two and a half minutes over. <laughs> I'm sorry. We strongly support the changes you've made in the legislation that will help the task force improve the transparency and inclusiveness of its operations. And let me just stop at that point and say thank you for asking me to appear here. Thank you. Ms. Luray? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the recommendations of the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. My name is Jennifer LeRae, and I'm president of the Susan G. Coleman for the Cure Advocacy Alliance. And on behalf of the patients, survivors, scientists, clinicians, and advocates of the Coleman family, we thank you for holding this hearing. And I, I also want to thank the previous task force witnesses for their honesty in how, discussing how this was communicated to the public. Let me begin by stating that breast cancer experts agree far more than they disagree. This is a point that we have stressed since the task force recommendations were first released. There is no debate that mammography reduces the risk of dying from breast cancer, only a debate over the timing and frequency of mammography. We don't want women to react to this latest controversy as a reason not to get screened. Coleman, in consultation with our scientific advisory board, is not changing our screening recommendations at this time. We continue to recommend that women be aware of their breast health, understand their risks, and continue to follow existing screening recommendations, including mammography beginning at age 40 for women of average risk and earlier for women with known risks of breast cancer. As you can imagine, Coleman affiliates have been inundated with concerns that the task force recommendations could lead to impediments to mammography. Many comments have come from breast cancer survivors who were diagnosed before the age of 50. This is a very typical one. I was 46 years old when I went in for my annual mammogram. Like so many other women, there is no history of breast cancer in my family. I was stage two, and if, I not, if not for the mammogram, I would have had much more advanced cancer. We know that mammography is an imperfect tool. But instead of stepping away from it, we must close the technology gap and come up with better methods. That's why Coleman is funding promising screening research. We must work together, government, private industry, doctors, and patient advocates, to deliver screening technology that is more predictive, 
and personalized but less expensive. Next year, Coleman will host a national technology summit, and we ask NIH to help us prepare by reporting on investments that they have made in screening technology. But let us also redouble our efforts on behalf of the one-third of women, some 23 million American women who are not being screened due to lack of access, education or awareness. We partner closely with the CDC's National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program to fund free clinics and mobile vans. Yet the GAO found that over half of eligible women for this program do not receive screening. That is a disturbing finding that underscores the need for access to affordable insurance to eliminate health disparities. And that is why Coleman supports the valuable patient protections in H.R. 3962 that would increase access to affordable health insurance, prevent insurance companies from denying coverage due to preexisting conditions, protect patients from high out-of-pocket costs, and increase access to mammography screening. In light of the new task force recommendations, however, we must ensure that women ages 40 to 49 will have access to the same coverage and cost-sharing benefits as women age 50 and older. Even a relatively small copayment reduces mammography rates. We do understand that H.R. 3962 will create a new entity which would not be bound by the task force's guidelines and that the bill does not exclude from the minimum benefits package services that are not rated A and B, i.e., we understand that the task force recommendations are a floor, not a ceiling. But our bottom line is that women in the 40 to 49 age group may, after consulting with their doctor, choose to forego a mammogram, but those who do choose to have one must have access to it on the same terms as women age 50 and older. The Komen Advocacy Alliance is pleased that H.R. 3962 includes patient representatives as advisors to the task force on clinical preventative services. We believe that patient advocates can help to develop and deliver effective messages about prevention and screening. We hope that these past few weeks of confusion will ultimately result in women taking more interest in their breast health that many more underserved women will be screened and that an intensive effort to make breakthroughs in screening technology will begin anew. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Dr. Sweet. Good afternoon and thank you, Chairman, for this opportunity. I am Donna Sweet, a general internist, and I am pleased to present the testimony of the American College of Physicians. I am a member of the ACP's Clinical Efficacy Assessment Subcommittee, which oversees the development of ACP's evidence-based guidelines, and I provide also comprehensive medical care to hundreds of patients in the state of Kansas. Because ACP does not comment on the guidelines issued by other organizations, I am unable to express an ACP opinion of the task force recommendations, but I can speak to the College's own guideline on screening mammography in women between ages 40 to 49 years, which was published actually in 2007. We recommend that clinicians should perform individualized assessment of risk for breast cancer to help guide decisions about screening mammography inform women about the potential benefits and harms of mammography, and base screening mammography decisions on benefits and harms of screening as well as a woman's preferences and her own breast cancer risk profile. The purpose of ACP's clinical guideline is to facilitate an informed and educated discussion between the patient and her trusted clinician so that together they can decide on a personalized plan of screening, diagnosis, and treatment. Not all women between 40 and 49 have the same risk for breast cancer. Factors that increase the risk include older age, family history of breast cancer, older age at the time of first birth, younger age at menarche, and history of breast biopsy. In my own practice, I use ACP's guidelines to engage my female patients in a discussion. I explain that mammography, although a potentially valuable tool to screen for breast cancer, is an imperfect one. For some patients, it will detect cancer at a more treatable stage. It can also lead to false positives, which can lead to biopsies, scarring, and potential infection. It can lead to false negatives. That is, mammography does miss cancers. It may result in aggressive treatment of cancers that may never have become life-threatening. Just in the past three days, I have had three different patients coming to see me who have been extremely confused over this whole issue. I was able to speak to each woman's risk profile and discuss with them the benefits and possible harms of getting a mammogram. 
One was a 66-year-old patient enrolled in Medicare who had come in for her routine visit for hypertension and clearly misunderstood most of the debate. She has a history of a sister with breast cancer. We have been doing yearly mammograms, and she was worried that I was not going to let her get a yearly mammogram because of these new recommendations. Another 71-year-old came in, and she wanted to get her mammogram, which was scheduled in February before January 1st. Why she picked that date, I don't know, because she believed that the government would soon stop her from being able to get a mammogram, and she didn't want that to happen. I was able to reassure her that I did not think mammograms would be rationed. The third, however, was a very good discussion, a 46-year-old woman whose mother had breast cancer. She wanted to discuss her own risk and actually was wondering if she had to have yearly mammograms. I was able to communicate to each of them that in them they did need yearly mammograms, that we did not do things from a cookie cutter, women should not be treated all alike, and in all three cases, as I said, they did and will get their yearly mammograms, but based on their individual risk factors and a discussion of why. The controversy over the breast cancer screening guidelines give physicians the opportunity to educate their patients on the importance of evidence-based guidelines to help them make the best choice for them. It also has important lessons for policymakers. One is that the public is ill-served when assessments of clinical effectiveness are politicized. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is a highly regarded, credible, and independent group of experts. Differences of opinion on the task force recommendations should be openly discussed, but it's not constructive to undermine public confidence by making ill-founded attacks on the integrity, credibility, motivations, and expertise of the clinicians and scientists on the task force. Such politicization, if left unchallenged, could result in future assessments being influenced by political or stakeholder interests instead of by science. Second, the ACP is concerned that the public is misled by some into believing that cost was behind the task force recommendations. According to ARC, the task force does not consider economic costs in making recommendations. Third, the public needs to understand that when health plans make decisions on covered benefits, they consider many different issues of which the evidence-based guidelines are just one. Under the bill passed by the House, health plans generally will be required to cover preventive measures for which a newly constituted task force on clinical preventive services have given an A or a B. No limits are placed, though, on a health plan's ability to provide benefits for other preventive services and to consult with other sources in making such determinations. Rather than limiting access to prevention, my patients will benefit from having a floor, not a limit, on preventive services. All health insurers will be required to cover, usually with no out-of-pocket cost to them. And perhaps even more importantly, has been said here today many times, millions of women who have no access to health insurance will now have coverage and the ability to actually get screening mammograms. Fourth, we need to communicate information to the public in a way that facilitates an understanding of how evidence-based effectiveness reviews support, not supplant, individual decision-making by patients and their clinicians. They should be informed that they have the right to know about the current best evidence on the benefits and risks of different treatments and interventions. My patients have the right to know that physicians will offer interventions shown to positively impact health and patient outcomes, and they have a right to know that we will not recommend interventions shown not to provide any benefit and possibly cause harm. Patients have the right to be treated as individuals with their own unique values and personal risk, risk characteristics instead of being asked to follow one-size-fits-all treatment protocols. And they have the right to know that the evidence comes from respected, independent, and credible clinicians and other scientists protected from political and other stakeholder pressure. And I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Doctor. Ms. Visco? Thank you. I'm Fran Visco, President of the National Breast Cancer Coalition and a 22-year breast cancer survivor. As you know, NBCC is a coalition of hundreds of groups from around the country dedicated to our mission to end breast cancer. One of our roles is to train advocates to understand the process, concepts, and language of scientific research. We analyze scientific information for our members and the public from the perspective of lay advocates. Our number one priority for many years has been guaranteeing access to quality health care to everyone. We believe we cannot achieve our mission without it. We have been working with Congress and the administration on this goal based on our framework for access to quality health care 
developed over a number of years of hard work by our grassroots leadership, and a key component of that framework is making certain that trained consumers have a seat at every table where decisions are made in health care policy. We believe in evidence-based approaches to health care as a key to quality care. So what is the evidence behind mammography screening? As we are all well aware, and as many people have said, mammography has significant limitations, and there has been much controversy over the years about screening programs. At what age are they effective? How do we balance risk and benefits? How can we communicate the very real limitations of screening and the harms associated with it? In 1997, an NIH consensus conference recommended against routine screening of women under the age of 50, but political and outside organizational pushback, not evidence, torpedoed that recommendation. So in fact, we have known the issues with screening for decades. We also know that 40,000 women will die of breast cancer this year. Tens of millions of people in this country are uninsured. Many, many millions lack access to quality care. We know we have a great deal of work to do to fix this situation. We know that breast cancer is a complex disease, that while we have learned more about the biology of the disease, in the four decades since mammography screening programs have been instituted, we have not yet learned how to detect life-threatening breast cancer at a point where we can make a difference, how to cure it for every woman, how to prevent it. Given all of this, we were frankly stunned at the reaction of the media and many in the cancer community and in government to the task force recommendations. The task force is a body of the right experts who look carefully at updated evidence and objectively made recommendations not that different from their prior recommendations. Given all of this, the amount of time and attention given to these revised recommendations seems just a bit unseemly. The public has increasingly put their faith in screening and early detection, even though we've never had good evidence that this would have a significant impact. But too many did not want to highlight the known limitations of mammography. They wanted simple messages. Once a year for a lifetime, early detection saves lives. The overemphasis on the importance of screening caused some people to state over and over again that mammograms prevent breast cancer. And please, let's be very clear, mammograms do not prevent breast cancer. We had hoped that the task force recommendations would cause all of us to stop and think about screening, take the time to look carefully at the evidence, and put screening and its limitations into proper perspective. And that can still happen. It's important also to put this in the context of the population we're screening. Screening programs are for a healthy population, for the millions and millions of women, the vast majority of whom will never get breast cancer. The question then is how we devise a screening program that appropriately balances risks and benefits for these healthy women. So what did the task force actually say? To women in their 40s, they said there are benefits and harms from mammography screening that you should know about, and you should make an individual decision at what age you will begin a screening program. So the task force actually recommends giving women control over their own health care decisions. On self-examination, Dr. Brawley pointed out that the self-examination touched on by the task force is that routine regimented monthly search for cancer. It has been represented as saying that women shouldn't know their bodies. Of course they should. This isn't about that. Some are concerned that the new guidelines will prevent underserved women from entering the medical system at all. And we would counter that the solution to that is to enact universal access to health care for all not to depend on a faulty test that exposes women to radiation and the risks of false positives in order to get them to a doctor. Disadvantaged women deserve the same access as all other women to quality evidence-based care and the right information. We do need to more move forward because none of this is good enough for women. We can use this, and we should have used this, as an opportunity to educate the public about science, about evidence-based care, to help alleviate the unwarranted fear, not feed it. Some argue that public health messages need to be simple, and changing guidelines will confuse women. We would argue that while messages need to be simple, they need to be truthful. Women deserve the facts. We've all heard from women over the past month who are outraged and who believe that a mammogram saved their life. These anecdotes are not evidence. 
They may be compelling sound by great media stories, but they're not evidence on which we should base this nation's public health agenda. That should be based on the type of scientific work done by the task force. We can't believe in science only when we like the answers it produces. I want to end with an anecdote. Carolina Hinestroso was the executive vice president of the National Breast Cancer Coalition, and her breast cancer was detected early in her late 30s, probably was not life-threatening, and she had treatment. She died this past June as the result of her treatment. Her story and all of the anecdotes just tell us how little we know about breast cancer, how we need to be so very careful about evidence and push for the right answers, no matter how unhappy we are with what those answers are. Let's save our outrage for the reality that we know too little and women deserve so much more. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're going to we'll try to get this done before the votes. I don't know if that's possible. But I'll start with myself. You know, I, I really want to apologize uh, to you, not, you know, maybe on behalf of Congress, if I could do that, um, because, um, you know, I, I was listening to what Dr. Sweet said, and you're absolutely right that this has been totally politicized. And I guess, you know, the problem is that, you know, Congress is political, and maybe this isn't the, you know, the vehicle for it. I mean, it's sort of interesting to see that in the first panel, most of the members were here, and the most of the media were here, and now we're on the second panel, which is not the political panel, and the situation is reversed, you know? And um, Dr. Uh, Ms. Visco talked about how essentially, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, but you know, after listening today, I was, I, I can't help but say, I'm not sure there really was that much of a difference between what the task force said now versus, you know, what the recommendation was a few years ago or even between what you're saying and the previous panel said. Um, it just, it's just amazing how you know, these differences, if there are any, have been exaggerated and, and, and politicized. But I, I guess that's just the nature of the process around here. So I don't know what, I don't know what we can do about it or make it any different. Let me, let, and, I, and, I, and I say that you know, out of sadness, really. But let me ask you just a couple questions, because I know the time is running out here. Um, and I'll start with Dr. Brawley and also Ms. Luray. Um, a few days after the task force recommendations, the Cancer Society issued a statement urging that health care reform create a transparent and evidence-based process for making task force recommendations. And I guess uh, Coleman uh, echoed those concerns. But um, your statement, Dr. Brawley, listed a number of changes you'd like to see in health reform, and you discussed the importance of transparency and the task force's process of arriving at its recommendations. Now, I believe that the bill, H.R. 3962, actually addresses those concerns. Um, so I, I wanted you to really, um, you know, answer that. I mean, the, the, this importance of stakeholder input and those recommendations you made about that, do, uh, does the bill, H.R. 3962, address those concerns? Well, sir, I, I believe that it does. I think the most important thing is that the task force continue to provide objective evidence, but also provide the objective evidence in an open arena where people can actually see the process. Okay. And then, Ms. LeRae, from Coleman's perspective, do you agree that, that the provisions in H.R. 3962 would improve the task force recommendations process? Um, I mean, you don't have to just say yes or no, but <laughs> go ahead. Um, sir, actually, yes. I mean, H.R. Uh, 3962 has a stakeholder panel that would advise the new clinical uh, services task force, and we think that makes a lot of sense. We think such a panel, I think, could have helped to really communicate uh, the, uh, the findings of this task force, and even though people might not have, there still may have been disagreement within the scientific community, I think it, the message could have been delivered in a, a way that was uh, much more helpful. To, to women and their providers. Well, I want to thank you. Know, I just was trying to make the point, really, that the, the, the issues that the American Cancer Society and Komen raised months ago, well before these task force recommendations emerged, you know, with, that we felt on the, that on the House side we were listening to. And, I, and I'm trying to point out that as a result of your efforts and this collaboration, you know, that the bill contains the changes to the task force necessary to improve the process. Um, that was my only point. And then 
The second one, uh, and I'm going to ask all of you this quickly, um, and that is, uh, as you know, my colleagues on the Republican side have repeatedly, repeatedly raised concerns about the House passed health reform bill in light of the, of the task force recommendations, and they've repeatedly asserted that H.R. 3962 somehow, well, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I think there's a suggestion that somehow the bill, you know, is a step backward on the issue of breast cancer or breast cancer screening. So I just want to ask each of you is, you know, on the whole, do you think the House passed health reform bill, H.R. 3962, is actually more helpful or is a step forward or a step backward with regard to women with breast cancer and these screening issues? And I will just ask each of you to comment on that briefly. Mr. Chairman, if I can just say, there are thousands of American women who die today because of lack of access. There are thousands of women who die today because they are detected early, but they don't have insurance that get access to reasonable and good care. Any effort that gets those people reasonable and good care is a good effort that's going to save lives. We've been talking about the number of lives that would be lost through this recommendation of maybe it was a recommendation not to get screened for women in their 40s, maybe it wasn't. But the number of lives that we could just fix, that we could just save through a logistical fix is tremendous. Just get them access to care. Ms. Luray. I would add, in addition to the universal access that Dr. Brawley mentioned, also the limitations on pre-existing conditions and out-of-pocket costs are currently a, a huge burden for breast cancer patients. And one of the main uh, items that our advocacy community throughout the country asked that we follow very closely in health care reform, and those protections are included in H.R. Uh, 3962. Dr. Sweet, thank you. Absolutely. This bill will help the health of American women with and without breast cancer. Uh, there are a number of women who do get manage to get diagnosed and then have no access to reasonable care, as Dr. Brawley said. The number of women, even in my own practice, that are locked into jobs that they would rather not stay in, they can't move because of lack of health insurability. They know if they leave their job and leave that health insurance, when they try to get the next one, they're going to be uninsurable. And I think the fact that this bill addresses getting rid of pre-existing conditions and guaranteeing health insurance to all at a reasonable cost is extremely important. And then the third thing is the bill does address some of the health care workforce issues. Um, Access means having a trusted clinician, as the woman from Florida said, and there are not enough of the primary care people out there anymore to be trusted clinicians for all the people we're going to give access to. And your bill does put in provisions to have an improved, I think, primary care workforce by improving payment and other things. So I think this bill is an absolute improvement. The millions of lives that we lose because of true lack of health insurance is much, much greater than what we're going to lose by a few women who decide not to have screening once they think about it. Thank you. Ms. Visco? Well, as you know, Mr. Chairman, the National Breast Cancer Coalition has endorsed the bill, the House bill, and we completely support it. We believe it is an incredibly important tool in eradicating breast cancer. We think it will move us forward tremendously in getting everyone access to health care and helping save lives from breast cancer. And I hope that this controversy does not cause the Congress to interfere in any way with the independence and objectivity of the task force. We cannot allow that to happen. We need evidence-based quality care. And I also truly wanted to ask the question that if the bill was changed to mandate um, sea level recommendations in a basic benefit package, if everyone who spoke to that issue today would then support the bill. I tend to doubt that. So I really think that if we want to save lives, if we want to move forward, if we want to end breast cancer, we need guaranteed access to health care reform, and the House bill is very important to achieving that end. Thank you. Um, let me um, mention, I was under the impression we had votes. In fact, we're in recess on the floor, so there's actually not any real time constraints here. Um, Chairman Dingell. Panel and congratulate them for their very fine presentation. I'm going to begin by reading something uh, which appeared, and you'll recognize it, in the statement of uh, Dr. Sweet. 
Under Affordable Health Care for America Act, H.R. 3962, passed by the House of Representatives, a new task force on clinical preventive services would be created, which would take on many of the responsibilities of the current U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. This new entity will have an important role in making evidence-based recommendations on preventive services that insurers would be required to cover, but the only binding effect the recommendations of the task force will have on health plans is a requirement that preventive measures for which the task force has been given an A or B rating must be covered. The bill does not give the task force of the federal government itself any authority to put limits on coverage, racial, uh, ration care, or require that insurers uh, deny coverage. Health plans could offer additional preventive and other benefits of their choosing, and no restrictions would be placed on their ability to consider recommendations from sources other than the task force in making such coverage recommendations. And now, if you please, starting uh, with you, Dr. Brawley, do you agree with that statement? Well, sir, I'm not a policy person. I'm just a, well, just, just a yes simple no. doctor, but I do agree with your statement. Sir. Thank you. I'm not trying to lay traps here. I want that clear. Uh, uh, Ms. Laurie? Yes, Congressman. As I said in my testimony, we also see the, the role of the task force as creating more of a floor than a ceiling. So in, in that sense, I, I would agree with you. Obviously, Dr. Sweet, you agree. Yes, I agree. <laughs> and I have some very good policy people behind me that agree. That's important, too. I'm just trying to lay to rest some of the nasty untruths that are being circulated about this legislation. You, Ms. Visco? Yes, I agree. Now, um, you, each of your organizations has supported uh, the, legis the legislation, H.R. 3962. Uh, do you have any apprehension that the provisions that we are discussing today or any other part of this legislation will trigger a nasty program of rationing health care? No, sir. No, sir. No. Doctor? Uh, Ms. Visco? No. Uh, Mr. Chair, I guess that's all the questions I've got. I, <laughs> I think we have laid to rest some of the unfortunate misapprehensions of our colleagues, and I can only express my great regret that they're not here to participate and to learn from the wisdom of our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Dingell. Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for being in and out, but we have both Secretary Gates, Secretary Clinton, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Foreign Affairs can be talking about Afghanistan. So although this is such an important issue for the district I represent, uh, I represent a majority Hispanic district that is also a federally uh, medically underserved area. And we face many, many issues when it in, in becomes encouraged to encourage women to seek primary and preventative care services. We rely on our Harris County Hospital District and our community-based health clinics to provide the services and screening for our constituents. I worry that the revised recommendations will discourage these safety net providers from aggressively educating and screening for breast cancer in these underserved populations. I often say we have one of the premier medical centers in the world, including MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center, located in our backyard. But my constituents can see the medical center. It's just hard for them to get there because they're substantially uninsured. And unfortunately, unfortunately, most do not have the access to the medical services. Uh, could you briefly speak about the current access, assess, access barriers for breast cancer screening minority and those residing in medically underserved districts face and what impact these recommendations may have on these uh, populations? Dr. Brown. Well, Congressman, I, I hope the uh, recommendations of the task force will have very little effect on uh, your uh, constituents with the accept that perhaps the discussions that we've had in the news over the last few weeks will bring breast cancer much more to the forefront. Uh, I have some hope. I, I said in my testimony about half of all women in their 40s and 50s who are diagnosed with breast cancer are actually diagnosed not through a traditional breast self-exam but through what we prefer to call breast awareness. They notice it when they're getting dressed or when they're in the shower, that sort of thing. Perhaps people will hear what 
this national conversation we've had and actually be a little bit freer to come forth and get evaluated by a doctor should they find an abnormality. I also hope that people will continue listening to the other organizations like the American Cancer Society that have said that women age 40 and above should continue getting mammography on an annual basis. But also I think it is important to realize that there is controversy about how good mammography is. And as I, uh, I'll just leave with one last statement. Mammography is imperfect, but right now it is the best technical tool that we have other than awareness for early detection. The mammography is much more valid than the PSA test is for, for males. Oh, no. <laughs> sir, yes, absolutely. You are absolutely correct. There are nine studies in the literature that show that mammography saves lives. There are two randomized trials on PSA, one that shows it saves lives and another that fails to confirm that first finding. Mr. Con uh, Congressman, I'd, I'd like to comment on that as well. Um, as you know, we partner closely with the CDC and, and other uh, providers to uh, support free clinics and mobile vans in, in districts such as yours. And so we're very familiar with the kinds of constituents you have and, and really a very fragile relationship they have with the healthcare system, um, many of whom are unsure, uninsured. And so we've been working very hard in these last few weeks um, to make sure that the hullabaloo around the release of this recommendations um, doesn't cause women who really already have that fragile relationship, who may just be coming into mammography clinics for the first time in their lives to say, well, gee, maybe I don't need to come at all. So we're working very hard to ensure that that, that message doesn't get um, twisted around and, and be taken as, as a sign that um, mammography uh, can provide uh, help to them. And I would hope, as a clinician doing this, uh, just as in my practice, women will come in talking about it. There is nothing more likely to get a patient to bring something up than to see it on CNN or in the controversial position. And maybe it will sort of nudge many of our clinicians who perhaps haven't taken the time to have that discussion to actually make it an individualized, personalized discussion with that woman about what she needs, along with the fact, as we said earlier, that many, many, many of those women, if health care reform can occur and we do have access to health insurance for the uh, poor and the people who need it the most, we will be able to offer screening to some of these women in a clinical situation that have never had that available. So I truly see this as a, a critical time. And the hullabaloo, it is a political sort of system, and there's a lot of things out there that just aren't true, I think. Uh, but it does bring women to discuss it. And once they bring it up, then the doctor or the clinician has to follow through. Thank you. Ms. Fisk. Yes, we are working very, very hard on making certain that everyone in this country has guaranteed access to quality health care, and that will certainly solve the problem. We are spending the majority of our resources on that issue. There are also a number of studies out there looking at what are the barriers to access for underserved population, why do they not access the health care system, and of course one of the reasons is because they don't have coverage for treatment. That is why the National Breast Cancer Coalition a number of years ago worked very hard to uh, get enacted into law the CDC Breast and Cervical Cancer Treatment Act because we knew that screening, even if you do get a mammogram, you have to have access to treatment if you want to save a life. And so that is our number one concern and that is where we focus most of our work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know I'm out of time, but appreciate you. My concern about the, the furor over this is that women will make that decision not to, and again, early detection is still the answer, and particularly in underserved communities. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I think that concludes our questions. I just want to thank all of you again, and, and um, you know, uh, once again, as I said to the previous panel, you certainly cleared up a lot of the misconceptions. I just hope we can get that message out to the media, uh, which is often difficult. But uh, thank you. We, we, um, you may, um, some of the members may submit written questions, and uh, we try to get those to you within the next 10 days. So you might get some additional questions, and of course the clerk would, would notify you of, you know, that and, you know, the time period to get back to us. 
But I do want to thank, thank you again. And without objection, this uh, meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned. Thanks. Minority Whip Eric Cantor said Wednesday that he hopes Democrats